So welcome everybody. My name is Kate Nicholl. I'm the workshop coordinator for Craft Skills for Garden Conservation and I will be trying to drive this all day webinar. It's the fourth in our series uh, that we've been running but it's the first this winter. So um, we're just getting uh, our ducks in a row and we've got all our speakers ready and waiting. So hopefully if any of you have seen our website, you'll know a bit more about the project. This is an Erasmus funded project that's running for three years. And the whole aim is to find and develop and share best practice in this wonderful field of garden conservation. So um, we know from uh, the last few years how heritage gardens have been so important to us throughout Europe and I would imagine in, in the rest of the world during the pandemic um, for people to escape from their homes and be able to visit gardens and open spaces. But they do need a huge amount of expertise to keep them in the state that we really want to have them. So we're trying to address this project by selecting nine topics and facilitating uh, ways of sharing. In the winter, we do these all day webinars and in the summer we do workshops. So we've got seven partners and if you can see on the screen, um, so we've got um, Sweden, Norway, who hosts the whole scheme, um, Holland, the UK, which is Plant Network, um, and we've got Germany. As I said, there are nine webinars over the three years, nine workshops, and then we'll be finishing off with five seminars. That's the programme that you'll see on the website if you uh, have a look and you can see we're now um, on uh, webinar number four, which will have a linked practical workshop in July in the UK. And then we've got more in the winter. We've got trees uh, and climate change in January and hedges and topiary in February. And then it continues the following year. Um, and now I think I can start talking about today. So um, we're actually um, showing slides from all over Europe with different experts. But the whole theme of ornamental plants, when we suggested it, we realized how enormous the topic is almost as enormous as the number of cultivated plants that we have in, um, in the world these days, which apparently is about half a million. Um, so we've got a program that will just skim the surface, I'm afraid, but we'll just hopefully give you an introduction and some really useful um, tips if you're in the trade of looking after historic gardens. So your program should have been sent to you um, along with your link. Um, so do consult with that. Um, but we're going to basically, and I'd like to think that we're covering such a vast topic with the overarching theme, it would seem, looking at the programme, that we're beginning with wild plants, with nature. We're going through 500 years of plant breeding and nurturing and um, working and expanding our planting palette. And in a strange way, in the 21st century, we're taking much more notice of nature again and how plants work in the wild and how in this terrifying era of climate change, we need to learn from nature and work with plant communities again, um, rather than try and impose our will completely on, on nature. So my first speaker who um, is waiting very patiently um, to start is Lenica who comes from Holland. She's a Dutch garden historian and she's going to give us a um, very uh, clear introduction to how all these plants arrived in our respective countries. Um, the movement for different introductions throughout Europe and the world and then the beginning of plant breeding. So <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. And good morning, everyone, uh, once again. Um, during the Middle Ages, about 600 species of plants were available in Northwestern Europe. And these were mostly native plants. But from the 16th century on, however, 
an influx of new plants began. And these exotic plants were only available to botanists and a small wealthy elite of garden enthusiasts. Next slide, please. Now this morning, I would like to talk a bit about the introduction of these new plants and about the new technologies that made cultivating these plants possible and also about the role Dutch nurserymen played in this process. Now, first, I will focus on the introduction of bulbs from the Levant, then on Mediterranean plants and subtropical and tropical plants from South Africa, parts of Central America and parts of Southeast Asia in the 17th century. Then on the trade in trees grown in Holland and then uh, transported to Northern European countries. Third, on the introduction of trees and shrubs from North America in the 18th century. And finally, on the introduction of plants from Japan in the 19th century. And maybe most importantly, I would like you to meet one of those very skilled Dutch florists who made, uh, who cultivated all these plants. Next, please. Now you probably know the story of the tulip. It was Auger Ghislain de Busbeck, ambassador to Turkey, who is credited with being the first to introduce the tulip to Europe around 1554. He sent some tulip bulbs to the court of the Habsburg emperor in Vienna and Prague, and the tulip instantly became very popular and impressed everybody with its beauty. Botanists working for the imperial courts studied the bulbs that were unknown until then, and they propagated them. And via Vienna and other royal courts, the tulip spread across Europe, aided by an international network of botanists and enthusiasts. Now, at first, the spread of tulips didn't always go smoothly. A Flemish merchant from Antwerp, for example, mistook these precious bulbs for onions. He actually roasted them and ate them with some oil and vinegar. I doubt they were tasty though. Next, please. When the botanist Carolus Clusius came to Leiden in Holland to accept the post of professor at Leiden University, he brought with him his collection of tulips and other bulbs. These bulbs were planted out in the newly laid out botanical garden in Leiden, of which you see an engraving on the slide. The bulbs were so sought after that some of them were even stolen. Next, please. So Clusius had a fence erected around the bed of bulbs to keep the thieves out. I don't think it was much of a success, success though. Next, please. Tops were, bulbs were very expensive and a lot of money could be made growing them. So a number of craftsmen started growing bulbs in their backyard as a second income. Some of them were so good at growing these flowers, they made it their full-time job and established themselves as florists in and near the biggest cities in Holland. Besides tulips, they grew um, a variety of flowers such as anem anemones, ranunculus, fritillaries, primroses, and hyacinths. And these florists try to cultivate as many varieties as possible, looking for different colors and looking for different shapes. Next, please. At first, the tulip was loved most, but by the early 18th century, the hyacinth was a favorite. It became quite a craze because it smelled delicious and it bloomed in early spring. Florists initially grew only single hyacinths. You can see it on the left side of the slide. Sometimes, however, double hyacinths would arise spontaneously, but these were considered monstrosities and thrown out. Dutch florist Peter Voorhelm from Haarlem was always keen to discard these seedlings. One day, however, he fell seriously ill and had to stay in bed for some period of time. When he was finally able to go to work again, he discovered a small double hyacinth in his garden. It had escaped the attention of his workers and the hyacinth had come into full bloom. Voorhelm was struck by its beauty and left the hyacinth standing. As it turned out, his customers also liked this new flower and wanted to buy it. So Vorhelm decided to grow double hyacinths. Soon other florists followed suit and started growing them as well. Now you can see the double hyacinth in the middle of the slide and on the right, 
inside is a picture of George Forhelm. He is grandson to Peter Forhelm, and he's the one who wrote down this story about how his grandfather uh, grew these special hyacinths. And that's how we know. Next, please. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm sure it will pop up in a few uh, minutes. Now, florists did not limit themselves to growing bulbs. They also started cultivating Mediterranean plants, especially citrus trees. Um, oh, there we go. Yeah, Just good. froze for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> now, these citrus trees amaze people because of their ability to bear both blossom and fruit at the same time. And besides, their fragrance was wonderful. The first citrus trees that reached the Netherlands came from Italy and from Portugal, and the cost of transportation made these trees quite expensive. Moreover, you needed to have a place to store the trees over winter, otherwise they wouldn't survive the cold. Now, because of all this, having a collection of citrus trees became a token of riches and prosperity. Next, please. So no wonder florists were eager to grow these plants for their customers, and they were quite successful at it. The important thing was that a citrus tree had to have a perfectly straight trunk. In practice, it wasn't always the case, of course, and then a so-called straightener, you can see it on the left side of the slide, came in handy. By placing a stick against the trunk of the tree and putting on a bit more pressure every day, you supposedly could make the trunk grow perfectly straight over time. Next, please. Now, Holland was a seafaring nation at that time, trading all over the world. The Dutch East India Company was created in 1602 and the West India Company a few years later. Both companies established headquarters in different parts of Asia, South Africa and Central America. The company ships not only brought back all kinds of goods, but also exotic seeds and tubers. And thanks to the transport of these seeds on a small scale, these companies, and especially the East India Company, played an important role in introducing exotic plants to Europe. Physicians and botanists regularly traveled along and studied local flora. For instance, the governor to Dutch Malabar in India, Hendrik van Rede, compiled a botanical treatise on the medicinal properties of flora of the Malabar coast with the aid of a local expert, of course. The treatise was entitled Hortus Malabaricus, which means Garden of Malabar, and it was published at the end of the 17th century. Exotic seeds and tubers that arrived in Holland went to botanical gardens and to wealthy acquaintances of company officials. Gardeners and amateur plant lovers would then try to grow these seeds and gather a magnificent collection of exotic plants. Next, please. One of them was a wealthy widow with a great passion for plants. Her name was Magdalena Pouille, and you can see her on the left side of the slide with her nephew. She was very well connected to a company official, and she owned an estate on the river Vecht, which was called Gunterstein. It's still there today. It had a large garden and a very famous collection of rare plants. Over here, you can see Gunterstein, and on the left side of it, you can see the orangery that Magdalena Pouille had. Next, please. On this engraving of her orangery, you can see she, you can see she had quite a collection of citrus trees, but even more special, she had hothouses to keep her tropical plants in. The hothouses were built against the orangery, as you can see on the picture. Next, please. And as you can also see on this enlargement, that people were very curious to find out what kind of plants were in her hothouses. Now, the invention of heated tropical greenhouses at the end of the 17th century was essential for cultivating tropical plants and keeping them alive. Gardeners and nurserymen learned how to raise and tend to tropical plants by trial and error. Often seed did not germinate or seedlings died. It took quite an effort to make these plants grow and flower. Next, please. 
Now, transporting plants overseas was not limited to tropical plants from Asia and uh, Central America. There had been a long-standing tradition of trade between Holland and Northern European countries like Denmark, Sweden, and Russia. And in the 17th and early 18th century, large quantities of lane trees and fruit trees that had been grown in Holland were shipped from the Netherlands to Northern Europe. Trade often took place through the city of Hamburg in present day Germany. Some tree growers even had permanent trading contacts in Hamburg or for instance in Copenhagen. Now the trees were transported in the hold of a ship and wrapped in reed matting or straw for protection. The roots were covered with soil, a layer of soil, and moss was also used to keep the roots moist. And sometimes even a gardener went along to look after the trees during the journey that depending on the weather could take a few weeks. Next, please. I'm sorry, it's frozen again. Yeah. Okay, it'll pop up in a few it'll hours. Pop up. Take it. Yeah. <laughs> now, you may have noticed that these nurserymen played a very important role in the cultivation of plants. And if the technique will help us, I would like you to meet one of them, Adrian Steckhoven. Ah. Uh. I'm going to wait just a yeah. second because I really want to see. Yes, absolutely. Why it should suddenly freeze, I do not know. Oh, there we go. He's oh, appeared. Good, good. <laughs> <laughs> we know what he looks like because his son-in-law made this wonderful bus that is kept in Vienna. So here you see Adrian Steckhoven. He was born in 1705 in a small village in Holland. And his father was most likely a market gardener who taught Adrian his trade. Now, Adrian must have been fascinated by exotic plants from a young age on, but studying botany at Leiden University was far too expensive and out of the question. So at the age of 20, he signed on as a sailor with the East India Company and sailed for Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. And while his ship lay at anchor in the bay to stock up on fresh supplies, Adrian visited the East India Company's gardens at the Cape and studied the local flora. After three weeks, his ship lifted anchor and sailed for Batavia, which is present-day Jakarta in Indonesia. And over there, Adrian also studied native plants. After a safe return to Holland, he got married and he started his own nursery, which he called the Day Tree. Next, please. At first, he grew bulbs, such as hyacinths and ranunculus, as we know from ads in the local paper. In 1733, he earned so much money selling double hyacinths, he was able to buy an extra piece of land and enlarge his nursery. Over a period of 25 years, his nursery gains an excellent reputation, and he made the front page of Dutch newspapers when his banana tree bore fruit several times. Now his nursery covered more than an acre and included a house, sheds, greenhouses, and hothouses. We don't know what it looked like exactly, but it most likely would have looked like the nursery Tulpenburg, of which you see the map on the right-hand side of the slide. Now, uh, at the bottom was the entrance to the nursery of Tulpenburg and the house of its owner, Zacharias Brachel. And then you see all these beds where, where bulbs and other plants were grown. You see rows of trees, but on the uh, right hand upper side, you can see uh, a part of the nursery where people could just walk around, admire the plants, sit down and ponder what plants they were gonna buy. And I think the nursery of Adrian Steckhofer would have been much like this one. Adrian Steckhoff employed several people, including pupils, and ended up earning an average income of 4,000 guilders a year. Now, the average income of a head gardener at that time in Holland was five to 600 guilders a year. So he was quite prosperous. And his nursery was estimated at a value of 9,000 guilders. In 1753, he received an invitation to come to Vienna and create a botanical garden for the Habsburg emperor. This garden eventually transformed into what is now the beautiful Schönbrunn Gardens. Adrian Steckhofer spent the rest of his life in Vienna working as a director of the botanical garden 
and he died there in 1782. Next, please. Before he left for Vienna, Adrian had handed over his nursery to his oldest daughter, Cornelia, and his son-in-law, Jacob Schuurman. Jacob had such respect for his father-in-law that he changed his name into Schuurman Steckhoven. Jacob was a skilled plant breeder himself, and he made headlines when the agave in his nursery bloomed and drew, and drew quite a crowd. Jacob was well aware of the latest developments in horticulture. He was one of the first nurserymen in Holland to sell hardy American trees and shrubs for gardens in a new landscape style. At first, he obtained these trees and shrubs from English nurseries around London. America being a British colony, English nurseries had easier access to American seeds and cuttings. And later on, Jacob started to grow these hardy trees and shrubs from North America himself. Next, please. Now, shipping small shrubs and trees from England to Holland wasn't much of a problem. However, shipping seeds and cuttings from America or Asia was not very successful most of the time. Often seeds and cuttings were affected by fungi or the salty sea spray, and some were also eaten by insects or in rats. Transporting plant material remained very problematic for a long time until the English physician Nathaniel Ward found a solution by chance in 1829. He discovered that by transporting plants in a sealed glass case, plants could survive the long voyage without watering and remain healthy. He put it to the test by sending some ferns in a sealed glass case to Sydney, Australia. The voyage took months, but the ferns were just fine on arrival. The case was sent back to England, filled with Australian plants, and these plants were also thriving when the case was unloaded in England. And thanks to the Wardian case, as it came to be called, overseas transport of plants became much easier. Next, please. Now, at the end of the 18th century, the Netherlands played hardly any part in the introduction of plants anymore. English plant hunters, in particular, had taken over. On behalf of the king, with financial support from the English government, the Royal Horticultural Society, and successful London nurseries like that of the Veitch family, plant hunters traveled the world in search of new plants. Despite being outflanked by England, there was, however, one place left on earth where the East India Company had sole trading rights, the artificial Japanese island of Tsushima of Nagasaki. In 1823, Philip von Siebold arrived at Tsushima. He was a German physician who was employed by the East India Company. Von Siebold managed to win the trust of the Japanese authorities and was allowed to create a botanical garden and collect numerous Japanese plants. However, he was accused of stealing a map of Japan, which was considered espionage, and he was exiled in 1829. He had to leave his Japanese wife and their daughter behind, but managed to save his plant collection, and it was sent to Europe, where it ended up in both Belgian and Dutch nursery, including, by the way, the obnoxious Japanese nutweed. Next, please. Now, with the Japanese plants introduced introduced by von Siebold, I want to conclude my presentation. We have seen bulbs coming to Europe from the Levant, as well as citrus trees from the Mediterranean. Ships from the East and West Indian companies brought small numbers of seeds and tubers from Southeast Asia, South Africa, and Central America to Europe in the 17th century. At the same time, Dutch ships also brought loads of trees to Northern parts of Europe. And in the 18th century, hardy trees and shrubs from North America arrived in England and from there found their way to nurserymen in Holland and elsewhere. Skilled plant breeders like Adrian Steckhofer were able to cultivate all these new exotic plants with the help of new technologies like greenhouses and hothouses. These nurserymen achieved quite a feat cultivating all these unknown exotic plants. We owe them. Great things. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lenica. That was absolutely fascinating and great to see a Dutch pers perspective on plant introductions because um, I certainly grew up with um, the idea that 
<laughs> that Britain led the way. And of course, it's absolutely <laughs> not true at all. Um, and to see um, how Holland now has exactly that role. Um, and just to let you know, um, while we're doing that, uh, there's a couple of things that we will be revisiting in much more detail. The whole theme of orangery plants comes up next year. <coughs> um, and of course, we're going to hopefully be visiting Hetlo itself for a practical workshop uh, where we're going to be learning about uh, fountains and ponds. So uh, it's going to be really lovely to get to know the garden in advance. That's correct. So if you don't mind, I take over. Thank you so much for inviting us to join. I'm going to just trying to share my screen. Hopefully you can see this one now. Yes, indeed. So good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I was asked to talk to you about the reconstruction of historic garden and um, talk a little bit on period design and plants. I will do so and then reflect back to our, our garden, Palais at Low, just to show a little bit like how it's been incorporated. So mine also seems to have um, a delay showing the next one. It's always nice to have all these technical Problems. Let's see if it will work with my mouse. Um, it does seem to be a delay, I think, Renska. Um, okay, once it we gets just wait up. a little bit. Mm. Sometimes it seems it has a delay, but very strange. So it worked when, when we did the trial. Of course it <laughs> did, yes. Uh, um, let me try this way. There okay. we go. Yes. Um, so I don't know if you know, but the re reconstruction and the renovation of gardens is only since 1981 addressed in the Florence Charter of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, in where it is recognized as an architectural and horticultural composition. That's very important also, including like its design. So it's plan in its topography, its vegetation, but that also includes its species, proportions, color scheme, spacing and specific heights. So also the rhythm within your uh, planting schemes is part of the uh, monument that is the garden. Um, it's structural and de decorative features. So it's also including all statues, follies, whatever is included in your garden. And of course, there's an important role for its water running or still reflecting the sky. So monumental garden, historic gardens are a testimony to a culture, a style, an age and often also the originality of a creative uh, artist. So if we start with looking at uh, the period, so if you have a specific garden, you want to have a renovation, uh, most of the gardens of course have now different historical layers. So depending on its history, depending on the, the owners, um, it changed through time with garden fashions and the, and the taste of the owners. But if you want to have a renovation, there is this choice which period you emphasize on if you're going to renovate the garden. And of course, part of it is the strategy of the organization, like especially if it's a larger organization, say the English heritage. I mean, there are a lot of different gardens incorporated in the organization. And then it's very important to look at diversity and uniqueness. If the, a certain garden has, for instance, uh, a layer of a uh, capability brown uh, design or an older layer that goes back even perhaps to medieval times, which layer will have main emphasis? And it's good to also uh, emphasize then uh, uniqueness. And a third point, also not very uh, 
unimportant are the, of course, available resources. And that's not only resources to carry out a large renovation project, but it's also afterwards having enough resources to uh, have the maintenance and to ma maintain the garden on a level that's necessary for the specific uh, garden. And I think especially that last part is uh, sometimes overlooked. Then there's an, a, a lovely budget to renovation, but afterwards there's not enough budget to really uh, employ the gardens with the, with the skill to be able to maintain the garden. Um, but so looking at, for instance, then uh, Paleis at Low. For Paleis at Low, uh, the Wilmina was the last royal occupant of the Low, uh, of Low Palace. So after her death in 1962, it was decided to turn Paleis at Low to a museum dedicated to the history of the uh, Orange Nassau family, so the royal family. And the rather rigorous choice was made to bring house and garden back into its 17th century uh, origins. So at the end of the 17th century, Palais at Low was built by William III, at that point, Stadthouder of uh, the Dutch Republic and his English wife, uh, Mary Stuart II. Um, they were looking for a new place to build a country estate. They already owned a few that were given to them by William's uh, grandparents, but they wanted to really build their own country estate with a new paradisic garden in the, in the latest uh, fashion, a Baroque garden. And they looked uh, particularly at the Veluwe, so the center part of the Netherlands, because William already had all hunting rights for this area. And they decided on this location in the middle of uh, Apeldoorn next to the medieval castle at Oudelo, which you can see in the left upper corner. And they chose specifically for this location because it already had uh, a lot of fresh running water at the location due to a relatively low uh, position um, in combination to the surrounding hills of the Veluwe. So there was enough water to really be able to establish a beautiful green, lush, paradetic garden in an area that was more rather rough moorland when they started building there. So then the question was, what was known on the design? Normally, if you look at the design, you can use contemporary paintings and design sketches, um, if you have any. Um, if you're lucky, there are good accounts in travel reports. And sometimes if you know the garden architect and the designer, you can also have a look at other projects of this same garden architect. Looking at the 17th century for the situation of Palais at Low, we know that the house was built by Jacob, Jacob Roman as the building architect. But for the garden, we now think uh, it was actually created by a co-creation team consisting of Hans Willem Bentink, who was the first Earl of Portland and a very close friend of, uh, of William, but also himself a very keen uh, gardener. There was Daniel Desmarais, who was the superintendent of all princely gardens uh, in the Netherlands. You had Jacob Roman, so the building architect, and Romain de Hoge. And Romain de Hoge was uh, also an architect, but also uh, uh, a, a draftsman. He, he, he painted uh, a lot of, so he was more or less like the spin doctor for, for William to really show his wealth and his uh, knowledge. And he, um, Romain de Hoge designed the symbolic meaning of the garden. So symbolic meaning in, in all aspects, as the statues, the uh, fountains, uh, everything. And this group of men as a co-creation created uh, the gardens of Atlo. And Romain de Hoge also made a lot of beautiful pictures 
of the garden. So here we see, for instance, the two privy gardens. So on the left hand side, we have Mary's privy garden, which included all special, uh, just introduced exotic plants that uh, Lennox had just uh, told about. So at the end of the 17th century. And on the right hand side, we see William's privy garden with a specific area in front in which he could play. Uh, uh, at uh, an old-fashioned time of crockett, we call it close, uh, with his friends in his uh, in his private uh, garden. So, but it's not only um, the real thing you see on those uh, contemporary designs and and drawings. This is, for instance, also a view to the back of the palace, also by Romain de Hoge. But if we look clearly, we see everything is just a little bit bigger than life. If you look at the, the height of the figures compared to, for instance, the large entrance in the middle towards the palace, it looks like the entrance is twice as high, but actually they're just, the, the entrance is just a little bit above the head of the person. So everything is enlarged, everything shows bigger and even more wealthy than it used to be. Um, I have to go back, I think something went. Okay. So, and there are two real design sketches that um, are still available of Palaiso at Loves. So first is uh, on, on your left hand side is by uh, Van Staden. And the right hand one is one that was discovered actually in 2003 uh, in former East Germany. And you can see that the general layout, although uh, looks very similar, there are a lot of differences. So what really is the truth? It's sometimes on based on design uh, sketches, very hard to decide on what was the uh, original layouts. Well, this was the situation Palais at Lowe was in the moment that this, this decision was made to bring it back into its 17th century um, starting point. At that point in time, it had a, a white facade. It was plastered with, with white on the outside. And it the, the park was uh, and, and garden was completely a landscape park. This situation started at the end of the beginning of the, of the beginning of the 19th century, actually when the Netherlands had a French king, Louis Napoleon, the brother of Napoleon, um, who ruled the Netherlands in the beginning of the, of the 19th century. And he plastered uh, the palace on the outside and he just covered the Baroque garden with an enormous layer of sand, approximately 80 centimeters. So by the time, they started digging in the garden to bring back uh, the original Baroque garden that was there. They found, well, let's say the hardware of the, uh, the garden completely still there. So they found the remnants of all the different fountains, the waterways, even the corners of the hedges were found as dark imprints in, in the soil, still present in the soil, meaning that for Palais at Lowe, we know exactly what was the design, what was the features and the dimensions of our garden. So we could use exactly the exact location of the waterways of the fountains to bring back that 17th century Baroque garden in design. And in 1984, it opened as a museum looking like this, in which the, the fountains, the corners of the parterres, the walkways, everything is in the dimensions as it was when it disappeared under this enormous layer of sand. But the focus for this webinar is on plants. What do we know on the plants that were grown in this garden in the 17th century? Well, of course, there is a general uh, question of what plants were available in this period. 
Lenneke before me already explained a little bit on what we know, what was there, what was coming in from the different uh, areas. But in general, if you work, for instance, with uh, uh, a landscape park uh, shaped by uh, Capability Brown, is there a specific set of plants, of trees that were almost always used by a specific designer? Do you know anything on preferred favorite plants? And if you're lucky, there are some reports on uh, plants that are encountered in travel reports. If you're even more lucky, you will find uh, plant inventories or order accounts with plants and seeds ordered by the different breeders. Um, and what you can also use is, especially also in our case, is what I would call circumstantial evidence. So knowing which social, which part of the social network also had uh, uh, gardens and in which you can assume that those plants were also available in the garden you're trying to reconstruct. And another source for me, important source um, of knowledge about the plants you can use is the use of uh, uh, contemporary herbaria. So in the case, again, for Polizic Law, we are very lucky. There, there are no plant lists. There are no inventories. There is a very small inventory, 1713, of a few edible plants that are in a greenhouse at that point. But we don't know exactly what was applied in the gardens, what plants were there. But we are lucky that when William and Mary became the king and queen of England, Scotland and Wales in 1689, Mary went to England and was never able to come back to the Netherlands. But she really wanted to know how uh, Palaisetlo was, was enlarged and how the, how the gardens was looking after um, she left. So she asked uh, Walter Harris, who was the physician of uh, William, who accompanied William always to his travels to the Netherlands, to give her a report on how the garden looked like. And he... Uh, reports on all aspects on, on how the garden looks like, uh, all the statues, but he also gives very detailed descriptions like this one, saying that in the beds and parterres of this and the other gardens are not only provided with pyramids of juniper and dew and with marshmallow shrubs of all colors, um, but they also contain in spring a variety of the most beautiful tulips, hyacinths, ranunculus, auriculas, daffodils, and in summer, we have double poppies in all kinds of colors, wallflowers, delphiniums. In autumn, sunflowers, nasturtiums, hollyhocks, marigolds. And we also know that against the walls of these gardens grow a selection of the best fruit, such as the best peaches, apricots, cherries, pears, figs, plums, musket grapes, and all kinds of varieties. So it tells us that Palaiset Low in the 17th century works with a separate spring planting with all kinds of bulbs, annuals, so a summer planting afterwards, and that also the garden not only is there to be beautiful and admired, it also plays a role uh, as partly as a, as a kitchen uh, garden. Other features we can use, for instance, are the beautiful floral um, decorations used within the palace. This is, for instance, the painting on the ceiling of our great hall. And if we enlarge part of it, we can see in detail that we have the variegated tulips. We have the, the, the large double roses. There is a hibiscus just underneath the rose and the tulip. We have a white uh, peony. There are the, the uh, narcissus. It's out of, I cannot see it myself at the moment, but. I know it's there. So we can use all those different 17th century flower, de flower details in the interior also as a, as a guideline. Um, so when the museum opened 1984, there was a special garden committee that looked down possible plants following also all the steps as uh, Lenneke showed us what was available. But we also know that this garden ha had a very special plant collection and they 
Willem and Mary were part of a, a large social international network that also exchanged material. So I also studied the Sloan Herbarium in the National History Museum and looked at the 17th century books. And there were three plants that were not in the original lists, for instance, that uh, could be found. So here we have, uh, I hope you can all recognize Leonotus leonurus, like a, le a lion's tail from the 17th century. Corridalis, it's, it's called here Corridalis regulus. And you see, if, if you can see the whole sentence, you can see here in the, here you work also in the 17th century with prelinear names. I will talk about a little bit more about it in a few minutes. And this is another plant that showed up in all 17th century uh, herbarium books, Cannabis uh, sativa. So that was uh, very special to see him probably used in the 17th century for medical purposes. Um, so if we now look, for instance, to this Leonotus Leonurus lion still, I already told you, you have to work a lot with pre-Linnaean um, plant names. So this one is very easily recognizable. So you can go to one of the taxonomical databases I use, for instance, a lot the world flora online. And if we then go to Leonotus Leonurus, we see almost at the bottom with the orange angle that this species was erod originally published by Linnaeus as Flomus Leonurus, and it can be found species plantarum page 587. So what I mostly do then is run to my very worn two volumes of species plantarum I have on my desk, because this contains a lot of information that's not available in most databases. So you might know, okay, Linnaeus is very important for our binomial uh, nomenclature, but he also did some another special feat, because like, for instance, if we go to five, page 587 of species plantarum, there we see this Flomus Leonurus with uh, the description. But what Linnaeus also did is like saying, okay, I call this species Flomus Leonurus, and it's the same one that my predecessors um, also stated like, okay, so he's saying it's the same one as that's mentioned in the Hortus Cliffordianus, and he gives the pre name that's given in the Hortus Cliffordianus. It says another pre name, and it's cited in, he says, Brian Sint, I will come back to him, or Morris Hist. And the species plantarum also have an index at the end of the second volume showing all the literature he used. So here we can say, he said like brain scent. So it's Jacob Brain in his Exoticarum Plantum um, Historium. And it's published in 1678. So meaning for me that, okay, so reconstructing to the end of the 17th century, this one is old enough, I can use this one. And the other one, mentioned for lay notice was the um, Morris Historian, so Robert Morrison's Plantarum Historiae, and that one is from 6080. So both saying that this plant would be old enough to be used in a 17th century garden. And I wanted to take the opportunity knowing that there are so many people, so many of you out there from all over Europe, that I, I would like to share uh, a dream project for the future. I mean, we bring together so much knowledge about the introduction of ornamental plants in historical gardens over different periods. Would it be possible somehow to start a shared database of available plants through time connected to these things like the stale, the age, and the creative artist? So I hope some of you out there will be willing to uh, consider if it's possible to make a new project working on bringing so much of this knowledge together. Thank you for your attention. That's a wonderful challenge for us, Renske, something that really could um, possibly build from this project. Um, I wouldn't 
begin to imagine how technically we could achieve that but we've got some people involved today who would know um and uh, you never know we might be able to start something really special um it was absolutely fascinating seeing how you do your research on the plants and uh, how you apply some of those um some of that knowledge to the actual planting. Uh, we've got quite a few questions. Um, so I don't know if Lenica, you could um, unmute and join us as well. And mm -hmm. I'll go back through the Q&A section. Um, and um, perhaps because um, we've got so many participants, we can't actually involve um, these people who are asking the questions. So I'll, I'll read them out and perhaps you could answer. Um, so this is to both of you from Jan, uh, who is from Norway, I believe. Uh, we've met at some of the workshops. So welcome, Jan. It's great to hear from you. Um, so he asked, could you say something more about what you would say characterizes the Dutch gardens in the 17th and 18th century formal garden and perhaps how it's thought to be different from the French and English gardens in the same period? So I don't know who would like to have a think about that. It's quite a uh, a big topic. Again, we're, we're tackling some very large subjects. Um, <clears throat> so who would like to go first? Um, well, if, 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 if you don't mind, uh, Lenica, mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah. especially if, but then I, I talk only for the Baroque garden. I think one of the things for the really deaf nights, more the, the Dutch Baroque garden would say it's, it's more limited in scale most of the time if you compare it to, for instance, French Baroque Gardens, but also if you look at the Anglo-Dutch Gardens in the UK, they're so much larger. I mean, we are a small country, there's mostly not so much uh, area available to include in your garden. So it's, it's, it's a small scale. Uh, and I think that one thing that I already mentioned, it's, it's uh, they're mostly pragmatical gardens. So they're, they're a lot of the times they're enclosed in water. Water is a very important feature, of course, in the Netherlands. Uh, and they're always a combination of this um, uh, kitchen garden uh, and uh, uh, the, the feature of being beautiful. So they're, they're very practical. They have uh, most of the times herbs included rather close to the garden, so close to the house. They have all these different uh, varieties. So it's difference in scale, um, importance of the kitchen garden aspect, and I think the emphasis on the species composition. So for Palais at Low, the garden really is uh, an exhibition room for very special rare plants. So um, the, 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 the plants really play uh, a key role in the garden. Uh, you have anything to add on, Lenneke? Well, maybe just one aspect. I, I did most of my research into head gardeners and their work. And uh, a very important part of their instruction was to keep the gardens uh, very well maintained and weed free. And if Dutch people would visit uh, gardens in, in Spain or France or elsewhere, they would also always comment on the, the maintenance of the gardens. And very often they would consider Dutch gardens to be better maintained. So. I'm not sure that it's true, but at least it was very important for Dutch uh, garden owners to have a weed-free, very clean, very nice uh, garden. Uh, yeah, and probably because they were much smaller, it's it's so much easier to see everything that goes wrong and every weed that grows in places it wasn't supposed to be. So maybe that also played a part in it. Yes, I can imagine that as a head gardener for a quite a small jewel of a garden you really can keep in in control um, right. now this is this next question that comes from Christian um, in Germany um, is actually quite um, linked in that he asks um, how were gardeners and garden designers informed about these new plants as they appeared um, was there magazines around at that time were there garden fairs like we would um, imagine going to and seeing the latest introductions so Lenico mm -hmm. if you've done your research on head gardeners mm -hmm. perhaps you could lead on this yes the nursery men would publish catalogues in which they would uh, write down what kind of plants they had for sale and they would organize their own auctions at the nursery 
but in the bigger cities in Holland, there were weekly markets. For instance, in Amsterdam, we, st we still have a very famous flower market many people go to, but that flower market dates back centuries. So during the summer, they would sell flowering plants over there, and during winter, they would sell trees and shrubs over there. So you could go to the market, you could go to auction. A city like The Hague had a, a public auction most weeks uh, where uh, nurserymen would bring their bulbs and would sell them off. So um, it, it wasn't that hard to find out what was on sale. And I think also maybe, especially in the 17th century, uh, this network of, of garden lovers, of plant lovers, of botanists, um, they were in close, close contact to each other. So they would inform each other when a new ship, ship had arrived. And for instance, the director of the Botanical Garden of Amsterdam was also a company official. So there was, were these very tight links between um, the East India Company, uh, botanists and garden lovers. So that's the way they found out uh, what had arrived. Uh, oh, that's fascinating. Renske, do you have anything to add there? Uh, yeah, well, oh, just a small thing saying that indeed in the um, in the higher levels more uh, so uh, the the network around William they had really had social events in which they showed their newest the newest arrivals and they were really showing off uh, the the newest exotic uh, uh, arrivals they had in their care. Excellent. So things haven't really changed that much in many ways. <laughs> um, now, this is another one for you, Renska, um, which comes again from Jan. Um, so is it possible um, to find out about the early plant exports uh, to, for instance, Scandinavia from Holland? Um, are there any records about shipping plants to Scandinavia? Yes, they are. I think even Lenneke would probably know a little bit more, but in our national archives and a, a, a lot of the uh, the archives are being uh, digitized at the moment, but there, there still is a, is a lot of uh, information to be found. Excellent. Okay, so in fact, this one from Martin Schmidt is linked um, about digitized databases or other resources that document the historical introduction and distribution of plant species between gardens and nurseries over the centuries, um, or any books. Um, now, I'll just interject here because one of the things we're going to have on our own website is a reading list uh, connected to each webinar, and it should be coming out uh, shortly, uh, hopefully at the same time as the recordings of this webinars, and there will be links to other databases. Um, so we'll get that ready for you. Um, but um, so Rensko, you mentioned this um, fantasy idea that we'll have a, a linked database um, for the whole of Europe, but what exists at the moment? Um, well, it's mostly uh, rather individual. Of course, you have like, for instance, they're working on this 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 what larger project to get all the Sloan herbarium because that's divided over three different lo localities in the UK, bringing that all together. But I think some databases exist on the um, the level of one country, but the interspacing is hardly there. And it's, for, for instance, if you want to know. Um, uh, for a, a specific designer, are there specialists that that are that know a lot about if there are any preferenced plants for this designer? Um, I don't know of of any database. I mean, I think that there's uh, well, it's lacking a lot. Yeah. Do you any know of any Lenica? No, um, I don't. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> Again, that's something that I really hope will come out of this. So one of the speakers that we were hoping to have today who couldn't join us has started his own um, lists really of introductions in 19th century British gardens. Um, and um, I'm hoping to convince him that we can perhaps publish those uh, on our website. Um, and uh, Lucy is joining in here. I was going to say, I'm sure Lucy Pittman, who works for Plant Heritage, will have some interesting points to make. Um, about... well, for, for, instance, for, for my point of view, I have this database of around 800 species for uh, now. I, I know it's backed completely by literature or whatever. 
these can be used for a 17th century uh, garden. I have been trying for years to get it published somewhere, but wow. like journals, no, they don't want pages with plant lists. I mean, yeah. uh, that, so, and it's it's an access database. It's it's very readable. Um, it will be available through Polisit Low uh, in the coming years, but we still are not there. But I would love to share that database because it's a lot of work, not only from me, but so many people who contributed to getting this all combined. So if I can share it one way or another, I, I would be very pleased. That would be wonderful if that could come out of this um, whole project. It would be really so useful for gardeners. Now we've got a question here. Um, now, this again is for Renska. Would you think, uh, this comes from Karin Sieber, uh, that Hetlo uh, would still be reconstructed if the discovery of the foundations of the Baroque Garden would have been found today rather than back in the 80s? And how would it be handled today, do you think? Um, well, the renovation of Hetlo, of course, was a very... Uh, uh, rigorously one completely going back to the 17th century i think if it was found now i think we would do a perhaps a partly reconstruction but i think uh we would look for a level a way of reconstructing in which you uh honor all different historical layers so that you show part of the, the, the Brock Garden, but you also show how the landscape garden looked like. Luckily, the landscape garden still exists around the formal reconstructed uh, part, but still, uh, I think we would um, work a little bit with, with a little, little bit more love and care for what was there later on. Like for instance, also when they found, uh, for instance, at the end of the garden, they found an, uh, the old mosaic wall. And uh, for the reconstruction, they first completely described everything, but the reconstruction is now placed in front so that the original remains are still there. So if future generation wants to really look at those again, they will be able to look at the, the, the origins and in the fountains, in the waterways, actually like they're almost demolished to bring them back. So I think we would take much more care of the different historical levels. Yes. Lenica, do you have anything to add there? <laughs> no, no, not, not really, <laughs> sorry. Right, okay. <laughs> Um, I think it is very interesting that um, the 1980s was a period of such amazing garden reconstruction, both in the UK and obviously elsewhere in Europe. And this is a question from Marika in Sweden. Uh, and she's referring to, you referred to the Florence Charter. Um, and she was wondering if there, because that's a, a pan-European charter that came out in 1981, which you yes. quoted from. Um, are there national um, legislation um, or is there national legislation for each country that steers plant use specifically? and plant conservation in other countries than Sweden. And I know, and we'll probably be talking about this later, uh, that in the UK, the listing system lists the garden structures and buildings, but very rarely, apart from the hedges, um, stipulates which plants need to be conserved. Uh, how does that work in Holland? That's the same in the Netherlands. Right. So we have like the description of the monument and the garden is included, but that's all the hardware. It's indeed not saying, I mean, it says something general as that the, uh, the garden should be kept in the idea of a 17th century garden, but it doesn't state which plants should be used. Interesting. So if anybody has any national perspectives that they want to feed into um, the chat or the Q&A, uh, we can pick up on that later, um, how that actually applies in their country. So it appears, uh, perhaps Marika wants to come back on this, that in Sweden, uh, the listing system does list individual plants, uh, and that comes straight from the Florence Charter. Um, so now we've got. If, if you look for the, the 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 Dutch situation between 1984 when the garden was 
uh, first opened in the museum. And now, I mean, there's so much more resources available in the international databases, new books. Uh, uh, I mean, the science of um, historical gardens has um, grown so much and the knowledge about those gardens has grown so much. I mean, if you put down a list like saying uh, these plants should be used, um, how could do you incorporate all the new knowledge of the or the or, or the or your growing knowledge about other plant species that come? I mean, we now have, for instance, this archive of the West Indian Company, and in the letters of the governor of Suriname to the Netherlands, we see that he all, all the the half of all his materials also go to Willem and Mary and end up in their gardens. But those um, that I think this uh, archive is published, um, is open to the public since three years. So it's all new knowledge. Yeah, indeed. So this is a, a, a broad topic that we're going to keep coming up with, obviously, at the moment, with um, plant choices and climate change. Uh, and it's going to come up through the day, I'm sure. Um, but would you, we've only got another five minutes before the coffee break. Um, but in both your experience over the last, I'm afraid we can say probably 40 years, um, would you say that you are now much more restricted in your plant choice because of the change of climate? I don't know who wants to start on this. Oh, that's a difficult one to... Um consider because we also work, I mean, we work with a different spring planting, uh, summer planting, we work with uh, thema th themes within the garden. Uh, for instance, next year, we're going to emphasize uh, uh, the wild plants for, uh, used within the garden. Um, so you always choose from this enormous data set, the things you want to uh, emphasize on. Of course, we know we can, if you would like to do, we could now grow bananas in our, our garden. I mean, that wasn't possible in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. So it's, it shifts, but I don't have the, the, the real practical experience that the, the palette gets lim more limited, mm -hmm. no, not as yet. No, how about you, Lenica? Mm -hmm. Well, I work mostly at the archive, so I don't have that problem, uh, to be honest. No, uh, no. yeah. Uh, something that I picked up on actually in a British newspaper on Saturday from one of our um, most important rose breeders was saying that they're actually going to stop propagating various varieties of their roses. This is David Austin, who you might have heard of, who bred the English roses. Um, so there's one that I've actually got in my garden that they're not going to be selling anymore, which is Shropshire Lad. Uh, which is very close to people's hearts in Shropshire. Um, and another one, which if you know um, uh, Gertrude Jekyll and her garden, it's called Munstead Wood. Um, and so those apparently are just not performing anymore as they were designed to do so when they were bred um, and are no longer going to be on the plant list. So again, Lucy, I'm sure we'll be talking about that in her talk about the disappearance of cultivars because plant breeders or nurseries no longer think they're viable. Yeah, but that's a different uh, aspect is that which part of your plants are still commercial available. I mean, for the 17th century garden plants, we already work with a lot of plants that are no longer commercially available. So we have to either propagate them ourselves or we each year have to uh, collect the seeds and grow them again next year because we for instance as, a, as, a, as an example we work a lot with Tachetis erecta the very large tachetis you see it a lot in 17th century still lives also but a long time the only thing you could get commercially were these very small tiny uh, species so we already have this well this green heritage of seeds and plants that we have to propagate ourselves because com it's commercially no longer interesting to bring them to the market exactly so um climate change is another example of that um shrinking at the same time as other varieties are being bred to cope with climate change and True. this whole yeah. debate as gardeners as to whether we go for the plant varieties that are more suitable for our conditions or whether we stick with the historic ones is 
uh, debate that will continue through the day and <laughs> for a long time afterwards. Absolutely. Lenica, do you have anything to add there? Otherwise, we'll wind up for a coffee break. No, I, I think through the age, the nurserymen has uh, have uh, always uh, adapted their their uh, supply to whatever was wanted uh, by their customers. So um, they didn't have the the climate problems, but they did have other problems. So they had to change their their supply as well. Uh, so yeah. Hello everybody, I make it uh, just coming up to 10.30. So welcome back to the Craft Skills for Garden Conservation winter webinar on ornamental plants, a rather huge topic, but we've had a really good start with two uh, Dutch speakers talking about the origins of um, a lot of our garden plants. And we're going to pick up now with a recording um, that we did uh, last week with Professor Mark Laird, who you might well have heard of as having um, done some amazing research about the, um, lands the English landscape movement, as it's called, of the 18th century, and actually shaken up a lot of the myths that we have had um, in our landscape garden reconstruction, in that we've assumed that only the woody plants that happened to have survived were used, but in fact, there was a much more floral palette of plants. Uh, and he will tell us in the recording, because he's based in Canada, so we couldn't really get him up at 5.30 this morning. Uh, he'll tell us all about that research and four case studies uh, that he's been working on, um, practical uh, restorations and recreations of gardens in the UK and elsewhere. Um, and then he will be appearing this afternoon when he gets up. Um, so he'll be around for all your questions. So to from Toronto, sorry not to be with you in person. First of all, I need to thank Kate and Rebecca for inviting me and for giving me the slot on 18th century planting and craft skills for garden conservation with the rhetorical expansion or retraction. And of course, I will be arguing in favor of expansion, contrary to the long held history of the English landscape garden where Capability Brown came in and he took away all the flower gardens. My argument from the flowering of the landscape garden onwards was that indeed flowers and shrubs did continue to exist and they existed within the pleasure ground. What happened was of course they're short lived, so they all disappeared and it required a reconstruction on paper to understand where have all the flowers gone. So first point is uh, addressed under Charles Hamilton's Paynes Hill. That's going to be my main topic. And I've given you the dates, 1738 to 73. Our research started back in 1981 and it continues through to the present time. So it's 40 years. The involvement of Kath Clark and Karen Bridgman, this is terribly important and it raises an issue to do with gender, which is gonna run throughout my talk and it will be a point for discussion. I've already mentioned my book, The Flowering of the Landscape Garden, 1999, with that emphasis on pleasure ground, not on park. One example will be our reconstruction of the amphitheater at Paynes Hill, which involves theory coming out of the book, practice over 40 years and adaptations. And I'll end with a question about where are we now? June 2022 was my last visit to ask a question, what about the next 40 years? So there are going to be four case studies that I'll intersperse between my discussion of Paynes Hill. I'll keep coming back to Paynes Hill but the four case studies, I think, will help to break up what would otherwise be a monolith. So a very quick reminder of what we achieved at Paynes Hill in our pleasure ground. 
particularly during the period from the 1990s through to the first decade of our present century. Here is that amphitheater. Here is our serpentine walk, so-called. And finally, the Temple of Bacchus or Elysian Plains area. This allows me then to introduce two protagonists. Uh, one, sadly, no longer with us is Kath Clark. You can see her. It's not a very good picture of her, but there she is on the left of the two figures behind a characteristic theatrical flower clump. And you'll see on the right hand side a mock up of the Temple of Bacchus, which was yet to be reconstructed. Finally, the Temple of Bacchus was reconstructed. And here is Karen Bridgman standing in front of it. This was taken three years ago, June uh, 2019, I suppose it would have been. And uh, she was uh, gathering together a number of flowers that she was going to be putting in her flower clump. And I happened to photograph some pelagonium. And pelagonium, I'll come back to. I have at the top of the screen uh, a flower theater. Uh, and this was at Gilbert White House in Selborne. And Karen came to us from her work with David Standing at Selborne. So she came with very, very good pedigree. This was taken just this past June. And you can see her flower clump, uh, the temple behind, and uh, a sense that things have changed quite a bit from how we had envisaged our planting with all the craft skills back in, say, 2010. So how did we arrive at our planting schemes? How was the flowering translated into plans and a process? Uh, William Tompkins' view of the Elysian Garden at Audley End, 1788, provided one model for planting up the Elysian Plains by the Temple of Bacchus, walking through to the end of the route at Paines Hill, which is the Turkish tent. And you can see the similarities between the Tompkins, our attempt at flower clumps, theatrical flower clumps, and you can see a, a correspondence between this tent pavilion at Audley End and our Turkish tent. So where it all began way back, 1983-84, when I was working on my thesis, I was looking for a planting plan as opposed to a painting to try to visualize the area that we came to call the amphitheater. It was described by various visitors. Uh, on one occasion, they referred to it as a holly garden. There was a big emphasis on evergreens. So fortunately, there happened to be the Lord Peter planting plan in the Essex record office done for his cousin, the Duke of Norfolk, 1738, right at the beginning of the Hamilton period. And we modified it to reflect the progression over 35 years towards the end of the Hamilton period, 1773. And you can see in the blow up that it does indeed contain some hollies. There is filaria box. Swedish juniper, laurestinus, red cedar, and so on, striped hollies. So this is how I translated it into a uh, picture, a watercolor. The strawberry tree jumps out because of its fruit. But right in the center, you can see that golden glow of the hedgehog holly, uh, ferox. Argentia or Aurea in this case. And then you can see those things like the Swedish juniper that provide the columnar effect or the red cedar. And then along the front behind the yew hedge, you can see a repetition of box alternated with three viburnum tinus. So we modified that considerably 
to suggest how it might have been managed over the period of 35 years. So taking away the hedge, hedges began to disappear in the 1740s and 50s and replacing it with an alternation of box and spurge and so on. And there you can see the Swedish juniper and indeed the red cedar. So here we had achieved behind the surviving cork oak, which dates back to the Hamilton period, we had achieved a theatrical or amphitheatrical effect quite successfully, but the slope, the theatrical slope was beginning to be unmanageable and very, very steep. So the pegs indicate how we were going to extend in order to make the slope more manageable. And here is my drawing to indicate precisely how you bring that slope down by expanding maybe two or three meters, and you uh, achieve that effect here by taking a bit of the lawn, a bit closer to the cork oak, and indeed, there we go, you bring in the things which quickly fill in a bare space, so cistus and rosemary and lavender, so there is a bit of a flowery element even to this evergreen planting. But, oh dear, oh dear, to use a particular phrase, I arrived back at Haynes Hill after a three-year gap. It's June of this past summer, and this is what I find the amphitheatre is looking like. So there's a lot going on here, which is to do with the pandemic. It's to do with the loss of mature trees. The huge cedar of Lebanon had to come down. It had been damaged in a storm. And obviously, there's more behind this image. So this will be a discussion point going forward, is how do we sustain a planting scheme, which originally probably only worked for some 20, 25, maybe 30 years. We managed to give it an extra lease on life to make it 40 years. but what about the next 40 years, changing climate, all kinds of pressures? So, a first interlude to break up this presentation. I'm going to have four case studies, which will be interspersed, returning to Paynes Hill uh, between these. And they reflect current work, and some of it reflects issues to do with gender. Some of it reflects issues to do with skill and pay for skill. So St. John's College, Oxford, first case study. And we're dealing with Robert Penson's work in replanting the groves, so-called, with shrubbery. And this is a, a lovely, lovely representation of what had been achieved when the horse, nut, horse chestnut trees, which are those four trees, were retained from the original regular geometric groves, but underplanted with a linear shrubbery, or I should better say a serpentine shrubbery, and then a shrubbery flower clump. What I've been doing for the college recently, I presented this last year also as a virtual exercise done in Toronto and then a Zoom presentation, was to show how they could use the Penson scheme with serpentine shrubbery and shrubbery clump to replant in an area which has been uh, affected by the building of a new study center and library. You can see on the image on the right that there is a modern building, and I've tried to integrate the old library front from the 17th century with the new building through planting and planting based around the scheme that Penson brought to life and using some of the plants that would have been familiar to him. In doing all of this, I've been Working with a colleague, Dr. Andrew 
Toby Mapson Parker, we call him Toby. Uh, his thesis, which was completed 2020, is a really remarkable piece of work on college gardens in Oxford and the period 1733 to 1837 corresponds very much to the Penson period. Uh, Penson lived on indeed to the 1830s when Loudon visited Oxford and his nursery. Penson by then was in his 90s, but the key period for him was the 1770s to 1790s at St. John's. And this brings me to the work that I've been doing with Toby. Uh, while Penson at St. John's was paid one shilling fourpence in 1772, he only paid his contract to Gardner one shilling out of that total because he had to make his profit, his operational costs had to be covered. And then he brought in a scheme of differential rates depending on what were considered skillful or less skillful bits of work. So this is where craft skills come in in a historical context. Between 1772 and 74, cleaning, digging, nailing, turning gravel were charged at that full price of one shilling and fourpence, but there were some other activities like hedge clipping or tree pruning that were charged at one shilling and sixpence. And mowing, interestingly, nine pence per morning. So if you add that up, comes to the same. This is the key point. Why a weeder woman was paid only eight pence or 10 pence per day for backbreaking work begs a question of skill. After all, women, particularly those who were called wise women, women who understood plants for medicinal reasons, they knew plants in a way that men didn't know, and surely that aided them in their weeding. Whatever the assessment of this inequity, plant prices drastically topped women's wages. Shrubbery meant, therefore, a graduation of injustices. I'm having some fun at my own idea of theatrical graduation to say, yeah, you can look at shrubbery from another point of view and say that it represented an accessory of affluence that was a graduation of injustices. So that's one very important point that is coming out of current work with a Toby. And we're looking forward to publishing in Garden History our uh, article about the college gardens. He's just sent me a new image I'd never seen before from Christchurch, and it's got me very enthused to get that publication out. A publication that did appear in Garden History just a few years ago, 2020, is the work I did as an offshoot from Payne's Hill Park work under the title Schoch and Shrubs, because it involves German interpretation of shrubbery. The exploration is based on a translation into English of chapter four of Johann Georg Gottlieb Schoch's Garden Manual of 1794, and I won't give the whole German title. The translation provides access for an English reader to, to planting in the style of Capability Brown. So this comes back to the fact that we thought for a long while Brown didn't do shrubbery, didn't do flower beds. Now we know he did. But strangely enough, we don't have any planting plans or a planting manual. He didn't publish. So Schoch, who was influenced by Brown travel to England, is our access to a world that is otherwise inaccessible. So we start by photographing at Paynes Hill two of these three evergreens, which Schoch had placed in his diagram in front of a flowering shrubbery. So one of them, 13, is the red cedar or pencil cedar, which is, of course, a juniper, Juniperus virginiana. And number four is the white pine, Pinus strobus. So I photographed both of those at Paynes Hill because we had an exact model to work from. 
Then I drew the characters. There's a spruce here as well. So here is our juniper in the middle and white pine on the right, taken literally from the Payne Silk model. Then the flowering shrubbery goes in behind. And at that point, I suddenly thought, well, I just cannot uh, manage to translate this into an effective watercolor. So a graduate student of mine at the University of Toronto, Bonnie Tang, took on a very challenging task of trying to translate the analog into the digital. And this is very interesting. She took stock images of watercolor paper and paint swaths were overlaid on top of the drawing to help achieve an analog effect. So here are some of her diagrams trying to work out how to do this. And to cut the long story short, and it was a long story, we spent the whole summer working through this, probably five, six iterations to end up with a result which made the cover of Garden History. And uh, a detail shows you just how absolutely fabulous uh, the quality that she achieved. Interestingly, there is the castor oil plant, Ricinus, which appears in the Tompkins view of the Elysian Garden at Audley End, but it's alongside other things, pinks and we have peonies and rubus odoratus, and here is our pine. So a third case study, this is a preview of what I'm working on currently towards a future publication under the working title, The Beauty of Flowers. So you have the flowering of the landscape garden, then you have a natural history of English gardening, and third in the trilogy, The Beauty of Flowers. And it comes out of work that I was doing back in 2015 on cue for the publication Enlightened Princesses. And I wrote about the cue inscription for UNESCO of 2003, referring to it as a very masculine inscription that had forgotten that Caroline, that Augusta, Princess Augusta, and that Charlotte, Queen Charlotte, were all involved in Q. And what they were doing there is a forgotten or lost intangible heritage. It's lost in the way that shrubbery and flower gardens got lost. On the other hand, we have to say that UNESCO, in determining outstanding universal value, has done great work in acknowledging intangible heritage. And this has positive implications for a heritage of women because tangible heritage, built heritage, looks unmistakably like a male-dominated heritage. So in the book, the third chapter that I work towards of The Beauty of Flowers covers New Zealand flora and Maori flora and fauna rights. It's a very, very new departure for me, but it goes back to my family connections to New Zealand. The second chapter looks at Linnaean botany, and I've worked with my colleagues in Sweden on this. And the first chapter opens with the local flora of Dorset and a representation of exotic flora in Henry Seamer's Butterflies and Plants. So that's a bit of a mouthful to get through, and it suggests a degree of complexity, which means this is going to be yet another big book, and maybe we'll try and see if we can get it out over the next two years. Now, there's far too much text here. I can't go through all of it, but chapter one of The Beauty of Flowers is dealing with this character, Henry Seymour, and his son, Henry Seymour Jr., and they're linked to this character, Thomas Robbins the Elder, whose work I profiled in my natural history. In contrast to the work of the Seamers, Butterflies and Plants, I'm looking at another Dorset personality, very important botanist, Richard Portney, and his writings on Linnaean botany. He worked out of Blandford Forum, and his first uh, flora of Dorset 
came out right at the end of the 18th century. So here we have Seema in the middle and we have Pulteney on the right, but we shouldn't forget a third personality, Margaret Cavendish Bentick, Duchess of Portland. In 1767, Pulteney made the acquaintance of the Dowager Duchess and many of her weeks in the summer was spent collecting shells at Weymouth, along with her botanist, John Lightfoot. Now, I've written a lot about Mary Delaney and her connection to the Duchess of Portland, but this is an opportunity for me to say something about her importance as an amateur shell expert conchologist. Pulteney credited the Duchess as the frequent discoverer of local species. So this brings me to looking at a few examples of the florilegium, I'm calling it, of the seamers. Uh, the emphasis, obviously, of a prior publication, which came out a few years ago, was on the butterflies. And Vane Wright uh, from the Natural History Museum, as an entomologist, did a really wonderful job of identifying these species, where they came from, whether the West Indies or from Java and so on. My interest, of course, is in the flowers, which they identified to some extent with help from colleagues at the Natural History Museum. Uh, but some of them I've been able to identify further. For instance, this one, Mertensia virginica, which would have been known as pulmonaria, like a lungwort, I recognize from my work in uh, the flowering of the landscape garden. The other one is absolutely unmistakable, and that is, of course, Canarina canariensis, the canary bellflower. And I knew that one from Mary Delaney, a wonderful collage on the left, but I also knew it from Thomas Robbins' posy. There it is amongst aconites and hellebores and so on. So just to take you through a few examples of this and the influence of Thomas Robbins, uh, it's quite clear that Seema was using the Robbins Florilegium, which is of course in the Fitzwilliam uh, Museum in Cambridge, the 108 folio studies of flowers. It's very clear, the copying, and this one has a little bit of Thomas Robbins' Rococo Shinwazari. What we're looking at is the Chinese Hypericum and, of course, a familiar North American species that made its way into the shrubbery at Paines Hill, Calicanthus floridus, with a nice swallowtail landing on it. The white flower here puzzled the experts at the Natural History Museum, and they were trying to come up with some form of Lanicera, which is how it was labeled. But I went back to the period of Mary Delaney and a number of the azaleas or rhododendron were labeled under Lanicera. So I believe that the white flower in butterflies and plants is indeed azalea viscosa or what we would call rhododendron viscosum with its very, very long stamens. And then a final one just to show how the son took over from the father. And we have a number of pelagonium that show up. They're not entirely accurate and the natural history Museum botanist said this is Pelagonium near capitatum. It's not really that accurate. But it brings me back to uh, Karen and her work at Paines Hill and the Pelagoniums that she was about to put in the flower clumps by the Temple of Bacchus. And it allows me to reflect on a whole dimension of the work and the skills and the craftsmanship involved in what Kath and Karen were doing in the period from American roots onwards. 2005 provided a chance to exhibit the principles of theatrical planting using plants originally sourced from John Bartram of Philadelphia. 
North American plants feature in shrubbery and they're a big part of my flowering of the landscape garden. To assemble a true Bartram collection, Kath worked with Woodlanders Nursery in South Carolina for strict provenance. Karen Bridgman, meanwhile, was perfecting the skills behind the craft of creating and maintaining 18th century flower beds. And that was a golden period for the creation, not only of the exhibit, but superb flowering plumps and flower beds. The successor to Kath and Karen was Andy Mills, also a very distinguished gardener, and he developed a different approach to planting in the walled garden where our American Roots exhibit had been located. He demonstrated great craftsmanship with vegetables as opposed to flowers. So the contrast between where it began, American Roots on the left, and showing how plants would have been brought either as seeds or living ones in a trunk, and then the work that Andy was doing in perfecting vegetable gardens in what was, after all, originally a kitchen garden. And this is very, very fine work with staking up his vegetables, and the vegetables would also go into the kitchen at Paynes Hill. But before his time, Karen and Kath were doing really, really remarkable work with flowers. There we see that pelagonium coming in again, and they showed how a theatre could be constructed, uh, a more elaborate one than the one at Selborne, in order to demonstrate the theatrical principle. And it allowed Karen to really exhibit her skill with individual plants, but also her way of combining flowers together. And these date from probably around 2009, 2010, the flowering of their skill in horticultural work. And these are just gorgeous, gorgeous images. I can't say enough about them, but am I making a point about gender here? I'm not sure, but maybe that's a discussion point. Finally, uh, the legacy of working with Kath and Karen, fourth and final case study, Horace Walpole's Strawberry Hill. Um, my efforts there to undo Walpole's rhetoric of Englishness, because he's responsible in large part for sort of rubbishing the whole notion about French gardens and the English garden, which we came to understand as something without flowers. But for me, the important points in his letters and in the study at Strawberry Hill was to see how much he loved French triage, how much he was enamored of the ancient Roman trellis work. So here, I brought together an image, and I'll show you the enlargement, and you'll see that this is actually dedicated to the memory of Kath Clark, as well as the memory of Mavis Beatty, and to Karen Bridgman. Right in the middle is uh, Oleander, and there's a lot going on here with sisters and strawberry tree, of course, for Strawberry Hill, and then the linden or lime trees garnished with honeysuckle. And there we translated that successfully into a beautiful, beautiful effect. And this really required, again, the skills of the gardeners. And there was, were a succession of head gardeners that Karen and Kath worked with before we lost uh, Kath in 2013. Excavations at Herculaneum had revealed frescoes of Roman latticework, Le Pitture Antiche da Colano. And my dream was to have John Quills for spring. We know Walpole grew them, give way to paints, we knew he grew them, and in turn, Narini, which we know he also 
cultivated. So here are those jonquils, and you can see behind the lattice vent, a bit of theatrical shrubbery, and then some details showing a canthus and strawberry tree and so on. So Karen and Kath provided the horticultural craft skills to translate my dreams, my planting visualizations into viable and variable 18th century planting styles. And looking back, it seems like there was an exquisite moment of flowering a pencil and strawberry hill lasting from about 2006 to 2016, losing Kath in 2013. In the aftermath of Brexit and COVID and facing climate change, we're going to have to think about restore plantings of this kind that they achieved in English pleasure grounds to be energized by a new impetus that takes into account a changing climate. Uh, fortunately, a pain cell, some of the plants we're growing there, like cistus, actually are doing very, very well, even in the drought conditions of this past summer. But what I'm arguing for in the new book is a pan-European view of the English garden. So I hope what follows my flowering, my natural history, the beauty of flowers, maybe in 2024, will complete a trilogy. Uh, and here, just sort of reminiscing, here are what Kath and Karen achieved. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the discussion when I join the panel. Well, I hope you agree that was a fascinating uh, view of the 18th century and the amazing work done by Mark and his colleagues. And great to see uh, women finally being recognised for their role um, properly, both historically and currently. Um, So actually, we're going to move on uh, to Dr. David Marsh, who brings us into the 19th century. Um, now, I've known David for quite a while. He's done some amazing courses out of Birkbeck College, um, which um, he's also translated. I think COVID has been an amazing spur to us all to spread knowledge uh, on this topic internationally and if you look at the gardens trust um website you'll see there's a plethora of courses that you can access uh, online um and he's doing one specifically on the 19th century at the moment so david while i witter on um would you like to share your screen and hopefully we will see your presentation there we are shortly yeah. Okay. Well, Victorian garden display in great mansions, public parks and private gardens was intimately related to plant hunting and plant collecting. There was very little that was subtle about mid or late Victorian flower beds. And even the revival of parterres and formal bedding in the reimagined garden of historic houses and their newly built mock 16th, 17th century counterparts were brightly colored and complex. But how did all this happen? We've just heard Mark's account of, of, about planting in the 18th century, but if you look at the figures here, you'll see that the, the 19th century truly saw an explosion in the number of plant introductions to Britain. Um, unfortunately, there don't seem to be any comparable figures for non-woody plants. But I suspect that's almost certainly because there are just far too many to count, especially by the 19th century, as a look at any plant catalogue will show you. So there are just a few, a handful of people responsible for lighting the fuse of this explosion. So just to set the scene, the first was Sir Joseph Banks, who had been with Captain Cook, landed at Botany Bay, and on the return voyage had stopped at Cape Town and saw the riches of Cape Flora too. When he got back to Britain, George III effective control of the Royal Gardens at Kew, and he determined to use them as a centre for the introduction of new plants from the colonies and beyond, and make them in the process 
the greatest collection in the world. To do that, Banks began a deliberate policy of sending out plant collectors, starting with Francis Masson going to the Cape in 1775, and this continued up until Banks' death in 1820. And the results, of course, are the cue we know today. Most of the plants, of course, came back in seed or bulb form because the problems of long sea voyages made transporting live plants extremely haphazard and unsuccessful. And although Banks attempted all sorts of innovations to uh, improve that situation, they weren't very effective. But all these new plants were written up in Kew's own in-house catalogue, the Hortus Cuensis, in 1789. But they were also written up in magazines like Curtis's Botanical Magazine, on the internet. And it's from evidence of the contained in Curtis and its later competitors and emulators that we can trace the introduction into horticulture of many house, uh, many garden and greenhouse plants. But what we have to remember is just because they appear in magazines doesn't mean they enter the garden. That can often be decades after the first introduction. Because it wasn't really Q that provided the main impetus for the globalization of the British garden more generally. It was the commercial nursery trade. And that brings me to the second person who helped transform the garden. I'm sure I don't need to remind anyone of the story of Ward's invention. Transformed the possibilities of moving plants around the world. But what you might not know is that his closed glazed case first proved its commercial worth through a partnership with a nursery in Hackney in East London. Run by George Lodges, they used the case to send plants to Australia and receive Australian plants in return without real loss. And in doing so, that led to a dramatic gear change in commercial horticulture, which led in turn to a dramatic shift in domestic horticulture and made our gardens truly global. So it's with Lodges I want to start. They published catalogues most years. This is the 1821. It has 70 pages, 70 pages. There are hundreds of plants on every double page spread. So we've got stove plants here, the pages of greenhouse plants, hardy trees and shrubs, and hardy perennials. And the only thing that's missing are annuals. Of course, at the time, it was hothouse plants that were considered the most exciting and desirable because the technology had only recently been improved enough to heat and glaze large greenhouses like Lodges had. So we have illustrations like this, and unfortunately, no illustrations of the rest of the nursery site. But we have mention of his exotic tree collection, which he ended up planting out uh, in a cemetery, and unfortunately, not much mention of hardier plants or annuals for the garden itself. Unfortunately, Lodges' lease ran out, they couldn't renew it, and they shut down in 1852 when the site was built over for housing. But by then, their place as a leading nursery had been taken over by James Veach and his Exeter-based nursery. Veach was later to move to have an open a base in King's Road. James Veach was a natural horticulturalist, but he was also a natural marketer, market man. He had a brilliant eye for plants which might be suitable for cultivation and sale. And he mastered the business of propagation and increasing the stock to make profitable numbers. When the nursery opened in 1832, he sent out a letter to potential customers that he had extensive and choice collections of stove plants, orchidaceous, air plants, geraniums, ericas, and other plants from South Africa and Australia. He had dahlias which he was then exhibiting. He had bulbs and 12 varieties of scarlet zinnia, which is extraordinary. The idea of there being 12 varieties of scarlet zinnias. These seeds for these or plants of these have probably been obtained from other London nurseries or perhaps European ones, or from ship's officers who bought them back knowing there was a ready market. He began winning medals for his exhibits. He began hybridizing plants such as dahlias, 
which were comparatively easy to hybridize and exploit commercially. But it wasn't enough for Veach. He was extremely ambitious, and he now saw an opportunity to secure a continuous supply of new exotics to be sold to the growers. And that was by employing his own plant hunters. The problem was, although he had the money to fund such a scheme, he didn't know enough about where to start. So he turned instead to William Hooker, who had become the first director of Kew, which had been taken into public hands and become the National Botanic Garden, rather than just a royal garden. Hooker was the opposite of Veach. He, as a civil servant, he had absolutely no money at all, but he had information which Veach required. So Veach started asking questions, which I've put up there, and these are all written down in letters. The correspondence between the two uh, still survives in the Kew archives. And once he got the answers to his questions, he set to work. His first collector was William Lobb, who he sent out to South America, where newly independent countries who'd got their independence from Spain were opening up to trade with Europe and to plant hunters. So Lobb went to Brazil, and later on, he went to Chile, up to Peru, and finally to the northern coast of South America before going on to California and north of there, up to Vancouver. And then soon afterwards, his brother Thomas was sent off in the opposite direction to India and Southeast Asia after orchids and other tropical plants. And you mustn't get the idea that Veach had thought of something new. This was not new. There were other nurseries doing the same thing. It's just he happened to be the most successful at it. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of what plants they found and how they were. Here's an Alstroemeria, for example, found by Lobb in Brazil, uh, sent back, and nine months after the seeds arrived, Veach had it in flower. And two years later, it was in commercial production. And as Hooker's, this is the, uh, a quote from Hooker's um, botanical magazine, that it was new to our garden and likely to prove highly ornamental. One of the other early plants that Thomas Lobb sent back so William Lobb sent back, is the striking scarlet flower begonia, begonia coccinea. This is probably one of his more horticulturally significant introductions because it plays a role as a parent in many, many cultivars. But again, it was Veach who began that hybridizing. And as soon as possible. And these exhibitions at the Horticultural Society were visited, of course, by all the major collectors, all the major head gardeners, and they became objects of great desire. Veach exploited that. You can see here on the list of 15 new and beautiful plants, you'll see at the top the Alstroemeria, further, you'll see the Burgonia underneath it. And further down, you'll see Bloxinia, for example, which had become very fashionable for amateur as well as commercial hybridizing later in the century later in the century. Well, of course, you never see gloxinias really today. What's also interesting is no prices are given, which I suspect means it's a case of, if you have to ask what it costs, you can't afford it. Now, initially, of course, Veaches were mainly interested in hothouse plants because they were the fashionable thing because of that uh, improvement in technology. But it didn't take James Veach long before he realized it was worth looking for trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants uh, in more temperate regions of the world. And most famously, of course, he sent out uh, William Lobb to look for the arrow, the monkey puzzle. And it appeared in an advertisement for Veach in Gardener's Chronicle, I think in 1843. And that's usually taken to justify Veach's claim they had introduced the monkey puzzle into commercial production. In fact, that's um, not true. They were very good self-publicists though, and because they said it often enough and loud enough, people believed them. But in fact, there were other nurseries who were already selling monkey puzzles long before Veach. But the point I'm trying to make is that this one nursery had already made a huge mark on the contents of our greenhouses, but equally importantly, on our gardens and parkland. And by the outbreak of the First World War, they had sent out 22 different plant collectors 
and introduced 1,281 plants by their own count, I should say, into cultivation. And you can see the range of stuff they were, they were introducing. And they were not the only commercial nursery doing this. But interestingly, it wasn't just commercial nurseries who were actively looking for plants. Q did as well. They sent um, William Hooker's son, Joseph, to India to look for rhododendrons. And the London Horticultural Society, now the Royal Horticultural Society, sent out David Douglas to North, North America, Western coast of North America, uh, to look for trees. And here are just a list of some of the trees he sent back, large quantities of seed of conifers. And when they got back, they were circulated amongst the members of the society, who in fact included Veach, and Veach soon put them on to commercial production. It's a slow process, of course, but Douglas is famous for saying when he was asked how many more pines he could find, you'll begin to think I manufactured them because there were so many new ones coming in. And so you can see how that craze for pinetums began in the middle of the 19th century. It was because of Douglas's new introductions. But the other people who were particularly interested in new plant acquisitions, particularly for non-elite gardens and growers, were Britain's seed companies. There were several of these founded in the late 18th and early 19th century. But very quickly, one emerged as the market leader, and that was James Carter of Carter's Tested Seeds. By the end of the 19th century, they were the largest seed merchant in Britain, near the 20th, probably in the world. Although, of course, they collapsed after the Second World War and disappeared in the 1960s. And they weren't the only major British seed company. Sutton's, for example, were not far behind them but there were plenty of smaller ones. Their catalogues until late in the century were dull, but only to look at. And a closer examination will show you that the range of seeds and bulbs that were available to the whole range of gardeners, not just the elite, but the middle class as well. For example, this double page spread is just one of several double page spreads of hyacinths. We forget that hyacinths were once the subject of a mania, rather like tulip mania, which lasted from the late 18th into the early 19th century. And at prices ranging from a few pennies to several shillings a bulb, you just look at the range of color, var colors, varieties, classifications of them. But I think one thing which would be really interesting is to see if any of them are commercially available. I suspect the answer is no, none of them which of course poses a problem if you're trying to be authentic. It's also a problem because even if you have a name, it's probably very unlikely you'll have an illustration to show you exactly what it looked like because not many of these plants were actually illustrated by the, by the magazines. And here's just a random page from the flower seed catalog. And I think you will find stuff there that you would now only find if you can find it at all in a really specialist list such as Gelitos. But the thing about Carters is they were absolutely central to the spreading of these plants around the country to a much wider demographic than one might expect. They used their grand connections. You can see here those illustrations are tulips and hyacinths bedded out in the royal parks where they had um, a contract. On the right hand side of that piece, you can see collections of bulbs potted up sorry, boxed up for sending out in smaller quantities to less elite uh, buyers using mail order. They were the pioneers of mail order in Britain. And very soon they started adding growing tips to their catalog too. In fact, by the 20th century after the First World War, their catalog becomes a hardback book stuffed with gardening information to not only uh, act as a commercial um, inspiration, but to really get people going into gardening. But the next question we have to ask ourselves is, what effect does this great explosion in the number of plants coming in have on garden design and garden layout? And the answer is actually, it's an enormous effect because it's coming in at a time 
when there was a growing understanding in the revival of historic garden features and layouts and styles, particularly from the 16th and 17th centuries and the geometric formality. But equally importantly, it's coming in parallel with the theoretical debate about color. Now you'd think that's not a particularly a significant fact, but up until the early 19th century, there seems to have been very little about a discussion of color theory, planting in color combinations. And what's noticeable is when Mark was talking about the amphitheater at Paynes Hill, there was a great deal of interest taken in the different greens, the colors of trees and shrubs, ensuring there was variety in the range. But it's not until the 19th century when we really see the idea of the flower border being developed that color begins to be debated thoroughly. And I think that's because it's not only being looked at philosophically, it's being looked at scientifically too. You can see this um, design here by Matthew Balls, who was the head gardener at Staganow. And questions like, should colors clash? Should they be complementary? Should they fade from bright to pastel, light to dark? Was green a color in its own right, or was it merely a foil to other colors? And amazingly, Matthew Balls uh, left uh, a, lot, a small number of his working documents, which are now in the Garden Museum, which show you precisely how he planned his work. If you could track down the species and varieties he chose, of course, for this parterre, you might be able to work out what line he took on those uh, questions of the importance of colour. The problem is, I think you'd be unable to track down many of the cultivars he was using, or even sometimes the plants. Head gardeners were hybridising on behalf of their employers all the time, and they were coming up with names which were associated with their employer. For example, I don't know who his employer was at Stangenhoe, but there's a plant here in the Bijou section, which is labeled Mrs. F, which was a, a plant named for Mrs. Fielder. And there are others in some of his other drawings. So if your employer had a particular passion for a plant family, such as pelagonians or verbenas or petunias or calcellarias or ferns or whatever, it's quite likely you would have been employed as a head gardener to uh, stress that variety and hybridize to produce more plants uh, of the same kind. And there was a particular emphasis when choosing new plants for commercially, which is that they should provide really striking colors, which could be planted en masse or in schemes like this to make an impression. And there are clear examples in the Veach catalog where one variety had perhaps a mid blue, when a darker or more purple blue came in, the first one was chucked out and disappears from commercial production. Many of these plants, in fact, the majority of the plants used in these brightly, brightly colored designs came from either South Africa or South America. South Africa providing things like pelagonians and succulents, and South America, the petunias, the salvias, lobelias, verbenas, and calcellarias, mixed up and matched in order to provide the maximum effect. There's absolutely no doubt the 19th century garden would not have had its distinctive look without that enormous explosion in the plant palette. Thank you for listening. And there's more about everything I've talked about on the Gardens Trust blog. It's difficult, this, I, I've talked about plant introductions before. It normally takes me 12 weeks uh, of a two hour a week course. So <laughs> crashing into 20 minutes has been a bit hard, but there's more about all of it on the Gardens Trust blog. Thank you so much, David. That was really good a little sort of appetizer of the amount of knowledge that you have and the resources also that the Gardens Trust now has. It's fantastic. Um, so I, I would like to now invite our next speaker, who is Maria Lofgren from the University of Gothenburg. And she will be sharing with us her research 
on um, how some of that, um, what we think of as carpet bedding, or she can actually pronounce it much better than me, tapit grupa, um, made its way to, to the Nordic countries and how you adapted to your climate, all these amazing colours that uh, were being brought back, in fact, from tropical uh, countries. So if you would like to share your screen. So, uh... This is going to talk about ornamental plants in the 19th century in uh, century garden and what we in Sweden called tapetgrupper. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, in Germany, you call it teppichgärtneri and in, in, in England, uh, carpet beddings or mosaic culture, something. In Sweden, tapet mainly means wallpaper, but the word can also mean textiles that covered furniture or, or tables. Uh, the reason to this is that the uh, uh, university's craft laboratory have projects on the management of historical gardens. And in this particular pro project that is going on now, my part have been the ornamental plants in the 18th century. And in this project, we work together with gardens. And in this project, we work with smaller gardens. And two of them have retained the garden style from that time with a lot of paths and flower beds. And you see them here. Uh, previous research in Sweden has given us knowledge about the history of the public parks in the 19th century and about the early days of the railway and the parks and garden around them. And the flowers has been a part of that research, but not in total focus. In my part of the project, we look only at the ornamental plants to deepen our knowledge about them. Handbooks in gardening and garden magazines from the 19th century has been studied to see the development of the flowering garden, as well as the management of them. And I didn't say that before, but I worked earlier as a gardener and garden antiquarian at Open Air Museums. So I, I'm very interested also of the management. Uh, in this, in the project, we visited some gardens with Tapetgrupper today and interviewed the gardeners also. And the history and, <clears throat> and development is similar to that in other countries. So I will just make some historical remarks and then take examples of some gardens today with their history and the choices that they made and conclude it with an uncertain future. Uh, I started this with the gardener and author Daniel Müller. He came from Stralsund as a gardener, a little Swede, uh, as a gardener and author. Uh, he worked at the Botanical Garden in Uppsala and also at the Garden Society in Stockholm. He shows two ideal plans for the garden in 1848. One is the English Landscape Park. And the other one he called a garden in the German style. He's the first one to call it German. And he wrote this in his handbook from 1848. And I think it's only in Sweden it's called the German style. Here it's the form of the landscape park, but now combined with two symmetrical sides. And according to Müller, the German style was particularly suited to smaller gardens. And new at this time were all the flower beds and the shapes of them and all the colorful annuals and foliage plants that started to fill these plantings. And the color contrast were most important and something that earlier perennials could not provide in the same way. Two, and this is a, 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 a bigger picture of the German style of Daniel Miller. Two of the gardens in the project we worked with uh, are examples of villas at the end of the 19th century. Both Jötlinska gården in Nora and Stora Hytnes in Sundborn has a lot of winding paths, lawns with trees and shrubs and several flower beds. They are also very good example of those two styles that Müller showed. 
Götlinska, Hesse Landskap Stale Garden and Stora Hyttnes, a garden in the German style with the two symmetrical sides in, in front of the house. There is also a centrally placed star in the middle of the courtyard at Hyttnes. There was also a style called Swedish flower group, and this was described in 1874. The gardeners who wrote, wrote this had not seen these forms used elsewhere. It could be just one group or a group of several groups, always with an odd number, and the one in the middle always been larger than the others. The Swedish, according to the authors, were the shapes themselves similar to commas. An early example is this from the Swedish Garden Society in Stockholm in 1860. The only one I know of which is in color. It was called the flower parterre. And in this one, you could see there are both annuals, perennials, you have geraniums, pelagonium, dahlia, roses, as well as red clover and rye grass. Another example is from the Garden Society in Gothenburg. Georg Lövegren was the garden director from 1859 to 1916. He was considered very skilled and created beautiful flower beds. He had previously worked in Germany at von Brocken's commercial garden or nursery in Lübeck and at Herrenhausen near, Han near Hannover. He called his work flower arrangements and with him came the heyday of the park and a lot of foliage plants and palm trees. There are several conditions that affected the development of the ornamental plants at, at that time. I will just mention three of them as the most important. The first is that plants were now available from all over the world. The second were all those skilled gardener workers and gardener who also started a lot of commercial gardens and nurseries. And for the third, the greenhouse technology that had developed and provided brighter and warmer greenhouses. In wintertime, many of the new plants required more humid and warmer an environment. Garden and parks at this time became the gardener's showroom where they could demonstrate their skills in planting and cultivation and through breeding of new varieties that could be displayed in the garden or park. And this is from the care program of the Garden Society of Gothenburg. Through this, they acquired a prestigious role as the kings of the gardens and parks and gained a professional posi position that they did not previously have. Uh, I have looked uh, at what was written about the plants and tried to see if it's possible to follow changes over time in Sweden. And I think it's quite the same with your countries when, when going from uh, colorful annuals and foliage plants to more compact. And I think I have it on the next slide. Uh, I take it again. They go from colorful annuals and foliage plants to more compact and low plants at the end of the century. And then also with a new interest for, for perennials. Both the state, way, state railways garden director and the handbooks described it like this. Uh, at first also heights built, were, were built mainly with the plant material. There is really no mention in the manuals or handbooks of those bombarded clumps. Uh, that, but we can see them from photographs that they do occur. And here you can see them from Neckers railway station. One question that comes up is whether the tapetgruppen were replanted several times a year in Sweden. The study shows that they could replace one group which could be a smaller group inside a composite group or replace single flowering varieties that stopped flowering. 
but there is no real example of that large group of thousands of plants were replanted at the same time. Criticism to this kind of colorful flower beds began at the end of the 19th century. In 1897, the garden director at the State Railway wrote that Tapetgrupper was costly, labor intensive and unfashionable. This criticism continued at least until the 1950s, describing the flower plantings as scattered all over the garden, unattractive, unnatural clumps of earth lacking in character, monstrous shaped flower beds giving a dull impression and showing nothing that could be called garden art. In the criticism, objects and accessories also become visible. Horrors in the form of the cane or stick what, that the flower was tied to, the edging of big shells and mirror balls and globes of glass. Uh, the flower canes or stick uh, to which plants were tied up on should not be visible. There were complaints when the plants only reached to half the cane. They should be tied, they should not be tied too tightly, and there were different opinions about their colors. Flower canes are very often visible in photographs, but you could not always see that the plants are actually tied to them. Uh, were they more for decorations? And see the picture from the manor park in Yimu, where the canes with the white tops are definitely part of the decoration. You could see the white tops all the way here, and you could also notice that the photograph has been very, he said, taken this photograph exactly on the right spot. Uh, Compared to this, you could look at these, these photographs from the manor house in Grängesberg, which is the most extreme form of using canes that I've seen. It's very unclear what, the per what their purpose actually was. Uh, if you, going back to, to the shells, you could see on these photographs, they were used edging, used as edging, but this is not often mentioned in the old handbooks. They describe, they describe arches of wood or iron or edging plants as hysopus, armeria maritima or buxus. But they also describe the beds without any border plants. They, the important thing was to keep the border very neat. The shells are, are visible in the critique, but also in photographs from the time. Strombuskiga, now protected by CITES, uh, so you can't sell and buy them, uh, appears in many photographs from the period, both in parks and private gardens. Both Jötlinska and Stira, Stora Hytnes still have their shells. Uh, Stora Hytne still has the catalog of the firm of Henrik Seinov, which sold shells, mussels and corals in Stockholm at the time. At Jetlinska, 100 shells were purchased in 1890 at a cost of then 100 Swedish kroner. Today it should nowadays nearly be 7,000 Swedish kroner or about 640 euro. But how could the underprivileged afford them? And how common is the use of them in other countries? Mirror ball, garden globe or laughing ball, it had many names. The sphere made of glass and then silvered, placed in the middle of the round flower bed in which one could see themselves and the garden could be reflected and distorted. There were all examples of things that became very criticized together with the colorful ornamental plants. So could anything remain after all this criticism? Yes, it could. The style also spread to the public, to the private gardens of farms and small cottages, if not as a whole garden, so at least, uh, at least the central circle became very popular. 
and a summary of the garden fashion at the end at the 18th century could be this roundel or circle from a farm, farmstead. This is a lawn with both trees. You see a new planted, maybe a fruit tree in the background. And you have shrubs for pleasure, like the syringa, the lilac, and also for utility in form of an rebus, a current. And you also have perennials like the phlox, the pyroni, and even an annual tropaelum. Uh, you also have um, the canes, what they <laughs> what they now will shown in this picture is it fence or something else, and you have the meadow grass, and I I would like to see this reconstructed somewhere. Over time, these gardens with all their paths and plantings were also threatened by overgrowth, simplification and personal opinion. But what does it look like today? What is left? And I will show you some ex examples showing different gardens and their choices. We started with a reconstructed garden that we met earlier, the Garden Society in Gothenburg. This is an example of a garden where tapetgrupper have been reconstructed from 2007. Work has been done to enhance the 19th century park and show its heyday. Tapetgrupperna that were the great attraction have been reinstated. An example of a restored garden is Huseby Bruk. This estate was owned from 1867 by the Stevens family who were one of the rich, richest families in Sweden. In the will of the last owner, Florence Stevens, she gave it to the state in 1979 with the wish that the park would be managed as in her mother's time. This is an estate with a park from the late 19th century with many flower beds. The estate had a lot of problems during Florence's time, but the shape of the flower beds survived during the years. And there you can see both a tapet group, as you see on the, on the right side, on a sandy field. You have a flower parterre with a lot of groups, circles and loops in the lawn, as well as a star. They are now working to enhance the 19th century feeling even more through the choices of plants to show the color combinations and contrasts that were very popular at that time. They have all order lists so they could see what plants were used. The gardens in the project are almost looking the same, but some changes have been made here too. I uh, thought I'd mention here an example of how a plant that is new in context can contribute so much that it becomes difficult to change it to make it more historic. The star at Stora Hytnes probably had an age of Hysopus before. As we have seen, Hysopus was one of the plants that was repeatedly recommended as a border plant. There is an hysopus in the perennial list next to the house today that they believe is a remnant of the old age. And sometimes in the 1950s, it was replaced by an Spiria japonica little princess, a shrub that didn't exist in the late 1950s. It was replaced, um, no, <laughs> it was a very good replacement for both hysopus and buxus, which both has the problems and is difficult to overwintering here. The spirea stays healthy and work well as a low clip border hedge. Hard to remove anything that works as well as the spirea. After all, the hysopus is still there and is an important historical plant on the site. An example of a totally new created or a period imitation is from the municipality of Katrineholm with a population of around 24,000 persons. They celebrated its 60th anniversary as a city in 1977 and a tapet group was set up in front of the Torn Hall. The city gardener at the time had Carl Götze's album for Teppichgärtneri und Gruppenbeflanzung and since then, a pattern has been made from this book every year. 
Every year a postcard is made of the planting and people travel here to see this year's planting. They now have 45 years of their own history. Unbroken tradition is not easy to find. Husebu may be one, and the other one is Julita, an estate that was donated by the last owner to the Nordic Museum in 1941. Here you can find the, find the French park, the English park, as well as the German park. The German park uh, has consisted of two circles. You see one here and one uh, down to the lake. Uh, but in effort to simplify the park sometime around 1950s, the one towards the lake was removed. The one closest to the house has existed since the beginning of the 19th of the 20th century and had much the same shape since at least the 1920s or not 1900. The central focal point has changed during time and some minor alterations have been made, but it has always been planted. Today, they change to perennials as a result of sustainability efforts. So what about the choices we make? How historically accurate can we be or do we want to be? Flora plant plantings with annuals and foliage plants are taken up every autumn and the bed or plantation itself can be removed but also easily picked up again. It's also possible to recreate them with historical plant material, not in the form of the name varieties, but gen genera and species exist. A very good source, as you've seen before, to see what plants were for sale is the price catalog or plant catalogs from the time. The Gothenburg's Garden Society's price list is available digitally with almost every year from 1860s to the 1960s. Today, plants are especially chosen that they are easy to care for. Foliage plants or annuals where you don't need to pick wilted flowers or deadheads. This means that we don't show plants that were available in the past, but is a time consuming task to manage. We don't want plants that need to be tied up, which means that the tall plants or climbing plants are not shown, but also has the effect that the flower canes or sticks are no longer needed or shown. And what do we get if we switch to perennials, a totally new history? So how do we deal with the future? Is there a future for Tapetgruppen from the 19th century? How should we deal with this form of green heritage and historic environment? A time when the garden mattered and had a strong sense of professional pride. Or may we create the patterns using colored sand, something the gardener and author Eric Lindgren saw in Victoria Park in London and wrote about in 1884. It contained no plants, but only red, white, yellow, blue and black sand, as he described it. Done well, it was effective from a distance and attracted the attention of visitors. Or do we need even more color in a cold world and even more flowering plants for the benefit of both insects, us humans, and for the history of gardens? How can we pass on the colored and flowered heritage? Thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much, Maria. That was fascinating to see gardens, um, both of the past and the present, and to hear how fashion really has such an important effect on the way that we garden. Now, we haven't got a huge amount of time for questions. Um, and of course, we haven't got Mark here until later on this afternoon. So I wanted to check um, whether you, Maria uh, or David, would still be here this afternoon. Can I get David back up? Do you think you'll yeah. still be here at 3.30? Unfortunately not. No. I've okay. his house's event. Oh, of course, you did say you've got another event. And how about you, Maria? I'm here. You're here. OK, so I've got a couple of questions that have come in uh, for David that I will ask now. Um, now, actually, I beg your pardon. They are for Maria. Um, <laughs> it's hard fine, to look at them at the same fine. time. 
But um, <laughs> I think there probably will be some more comments here uh, that you could come in with, Mark, as we only have a few minutes left. So this is Jan in Norway um, saying in the latter part of the 19th century, um, perennials start to get used again. And did you think this is for Maria, really, but I think, David, you might have some views as well. Was that done to save labour and costs or was it because there was a wider range of plants to create different designs? Um, shall I kick off on that? Yeah, it's why not, David? Exactly the opposite. Labour was cheap at the end of the 19th century in Britain um, and I don't see much sign of perennials being used in greater quantities. In fact, what we see, I think, is a big push to even more elaborate, and we're moving on to carpet bedding, which starts in the 1870s. Um, by the time you get to the 1880s and 1890s, it's outrageous. Um, and there's that the famous quote, you know, if you're a gentleman, you have 10,000 bedding plants. If you're a count, you know, an earl, you have 30,000. And if you're a duke, you have 50,000. And that's from the end of the century. So I think in the formal areas around houses, grand houses, the perennials are not coming in at all. Not really. I might, I might be completely wrong, but my impression is not at all. OK. And how about you, Maria? Do you think there were many being used in, in the Nordic countries? Yes, but not in the tapet grouper. I think they changed to the, the list, the flower beds towards the house more. And I could also see that they who complaints are also nurseries men, that they started the perennials nurseries at the time. So of course they wanted to, to sell the perennials. They were interested in them also. So, so I think it's, but I also think that they, that they were labor intensive is quoted by them. So I think that is a, a question too in Sweden at that time. Can yeah. I come back here because I just realized, of course, I put my foot in it. I was thinking about the formal designs around houses. Of course, what we also get starting in about the early 1840s, but building up to a climax in the 1910s are the herbaceous borders, where of course, perennials are the dominant feature. Um, yeah. but, that's, but I was I was trying to concentrate on the, you know, the formal stuff. But Absolutely. yes, so perennials in herbaceous borders, very much the case. Okay, and now this is a question for both of you. Um, currently, how do you think most of the visitors to gardens um, view that sort of very formal carpet bedding? Again, it's a question of fashion and who you talk to, but what's your view in Sweden, Maria, for um, how people uh, view those planting schemes? I think it's both. I think there are, are the both ways because all these annuals, we need we need the greenhouses or hothouses for them over winter or, or during their uh, the, the beginning of, the, of their life. So, and still I think that people also, we need that flowering. I can see that annuals are used very much in our cities today, not in Tabet Group, but we use the colors uh, and the annuals very much. But I, uh, I think it's both. I don't, I don't really know what is more than right. That. And what's your feeling, David? I, I would probably agree with that. I think there's, there's a love and hate thing about carpet bedding, but you, one can't help but admire and go, wow, when you see it done properly. I, it was, I, as you know, I've taken over the slot from Dan. And when I was last at Brodsworth, walking around the corner and seeing the formal of the house, it is stunning. I mean, I, as, a, as a gardener myself, I have stopped growing annuals for all sorts of reasons. It's just too much hard work. And I suspect that's what's going to happen. It's going to become too expensive, to uh, in terms of energy, in terms of resources, to to do much of it. But when it's done properly, my goodness, is it, it is extraordinary. Yes. So it's, it's an, oh, sorry, Maria. And and the professional pride in the gardeners 
when I yeah. interview them, they are so proud, or proud over what they're doing and and how they yeah. make it look exactly as it should, in a way. Yeah. I yeah. think that... Sorry, I was going to say that topic of the skills of the gardeners is obviously central to our whole project here. And I think we'll discuss it a lot more this afternoon. So, David, you were wanting to say something quickly because you're not going to be only, here this afternoon. I was only going to say that it's very interesting when you look at in Britain, we have a lot of volunteers running gardens now. And if you look at what volunteer groups like to do, carpet bedding is pretty high up on the list. I, I did a piece recently on the Gardens Trust blog about floral clocks in the early 20th century. Where they're being recreated, seaside gardens in Britain, that kind of carpet bedding, formal stuff in as many colours as you can think of, is really popular with the punters. <laughs> right. OK, so... ...slightly. Um, it obviously depends on how you describe where you're from. But it would seem in our little word cloud that Sweden is still uh, in the lead, as it were, um, closely followed, I would say, by Norway and the UK. But interestingly, we've got Spain um, and, oh gosh, um, lots of, oh, Shropshire, of course, North Wales. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering whether we've got any other countries oh Poland great welcome from Poland um Sweden obviously Norway Germany the Netherlands uh Scotland great um so that's a great range of um international participants and then this is uh, the periods of gardening that people have a strong interest in and this is um <laughs> changing all the time as people uh add their comments so interestingly, uh, the majority um, are interested in everything, which is great, <laughs> particularly when we're talking about layers of uh, garden design, because we've probably all got a good representation of different layers. And then it's the 19th century, 20th century going down, obviously the further back. Um, and only a very few, just the modern or contemporary style, which I suppose is obvious. We are talking about garden conservation here rather than contemporary uh, gardens. And then this is the style. Oh, wow. So naturalistic planting is definitely the winner um, there, which is very interesting, closely followed by a historically authentic and sustainable, which is a very important combination of terms. Got a good arts and crafts vote there um and a few formals um so that's great now i think we're definitely at uh, just after two o'clock so it's time to welcome alison crook who is an old colleague of mine in the national trust so welcome alison she's now got the wonderful mm -hmm. title of national curator for living collections <laughs> at the National Trust yes. in the UK. Yes. So that sounds incredibly grand. Um, and I've got a lovely description of all the different, uh, I think you're going to go through this in your slides, the different gardens. A little bit, yeah. So I won't go into that now. Um, but really, from uh, the point of view of the gardener, we've been hearing this morning about how plants um, arrived, how they were bred, uh, grew, spread around Europe. But as a gardener, how on earth do you keep tabs on what you've got, what you perhaps had in the past and what you might want in the future? So Alison is going to tell us all about that. So hello, everybody. Um, thank you for the invite to talk to you all today. Um, I was asked to, to talk a little on plant records uh, and how to manage those. Um, it's a huge subject and I know that already you've covered large numbers of subjects around um, living collections as a whole the different types of styles of gardens I can see is very varied um, for all the participants so it's not really 
very easy for any one person to say this is what a record looks like. Rather than try and attempt that, I'm going to take some ideas to perhaps ponder on when you're thinking about the importance of records um, and also tell a few stories along the way that will perhaps highlight some of, of the ideas that I'm going to share with you. So this is a, an image that I love. It's of Bodnant Garden in North Wales, one of the National Trust Garden, and it's possibly one of the most co complex collections of plants that we have. And I love it because it's people wandering off into the wild while they explore them. So here we have original introductions from some of the plant hunters, as well as plants bred on site. Many, many layers of design within one garden. Um, so what I'm going to take a quick look at today is an overview of why records are so important and also at a very high level what you should be recording or thinking about recording and how to go about recording that. Now as Kate said my my title is the National Curator of Living Collections which is um, a title that many people share in in botanic gardens but have a slightly different role. I don't look after a garden myself. I look after a team of people that help all of our head gardeners out in the 220 plus gardens that we have within the National Trust that help them care for their collections. So I provide a series of guidance, of uh, support services, tools, including a plant conservation centre for some of our rarest plants. Um, and one of the one of the aspects of my work is looking after the systems that we use and that all of our gardeners use to record our plants um, and to tell the stories about our plants. So just a couple of plants here uh, to talk about. One is Stourhead, which is one of our early 18th century landscape gardens, um, very famous, uh, worldwide famous. Um, and this is a particular plant which I love, which is the Liriodendron tulipifera, uh, the tulip tree. It sits on an island in the lake um, and really stands out in the autumn with this glorious colour. And Stourhead is full of early introductions of these plants that were brought in from all around the world in the, in the early 18th century. Um, the next example is perhaps one of our most famous plants. You can think that a record for uh, an early introduction might include where it came from, um, who paid for the, the plant hunter to go out and find the information. There may be a letter associated with that um, and some notes from where the material was gathered. But the second plant on, my, on this screen is Isaac Newton's apple tree. This is Isaac Newton's family home, his childhood home where he grew up. And Isaac Newton, uh, for those of you who, who may not be aware, is um, a very famous uh, British scientist. He came up with the idea of gravity. And it is said that he, that was prompted through watching an apple fall from this very tree. This tree, if you thought about a record for this tree, I think we there are countless children, progeny around the world. There's been seed sent up to the space station, um, which has come back down and um, then been propagated, um, germinated and propagated and, and planted out. So a record, an ideal record for Newton's apple tree might run to several books and a couple of PhDs. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to, to answer the question of what a great record for that what tree, single tree might look like. So let's look at why records are so important and then we'll briefly touch on what and how to record. So records in garden are key, difficult and more important than um, the records in museums or in houses because they constantly change. Our gardens constantly change. The plants are alive or they're dead or they hide themselves or they change colour or they decide to be in flower or in fruit. So the whole process of managing our plants it is a process. It's a journey of constant change. Um, and in this change, you know, we are often involved in, in contributing to that. We prune things, we weed things, we train them as gardeners. You know, we we sometimes try and prevent change, but with plants, it's very difficult to, to stop it. Um, 
So there's constant things happening. Every task in garden might need a record associated with it. So when did we last prune a plant? When did we last feed it? What pests and diseases does it is it suffering from? Um, are we needing to reduce the crowd tree in order to protect it? So, but the most important thing at the end of keeping all these records and thinking about our collections as, as constantly changing is people. You know, we keep our collections arguably for, for, you know, often for biodiversity reasons, but a lot of the time it's to tell stories to people. Um, and without records, we, we will struggle always to tell those stories, to welcome visitors in our gardens and to celebrate and, and learn from our collections, our amazing collections of plants. So to give an idea about why records at the National Trust are particularly important, which hopefully you kind of see the, the sort of size of the thing that we're dealing with here, uh, we have over 220 gardens and over 200 parks, and about 180 of those are registered with an organization called Historic England as being um, of particular significance, both nationally and internationally. We have 650 gardeners who might want to be interested in records. And although you may be coming from small gardens, many of these gardens that we're looking after are very small and some of them have only one gardener. So records at that garden may be of a different size and shape to records at a garden where there are more than say 10 gardeners working. Um, we also have what we call rangers out um, looking after some of our parklands and in our countryside and things like our um, heritage orchards and our ancient and veteran trees. And then we can have over 10,000 volunteers who are also helping us uh, care for these amazing spaces um, and looking after our plants. So our records have to have a number of audiences both internally before we even start thinking about sharing that information with the broader public. Um, we have 32,000 taxa recorded so far, and every taxonomic um, record is a, is a is a subject of its of its own. Um, within a museum, it's unlikely that a chair is ever going to be called a table, but we all know that um, within the plant world, we can often find our taxonomy changing um, on a on a very regular basis. We have 220,000 actions recorded so far across all of these gardens, but I'm sure that number will increase uh, over coming years. And then going back to the point of why records are so important as to, to help all these people understand what we have within our elections. But the fact that what we're trying to do, and I think, you know, the hopefully this resonates with so many of you in your own gardens, is that the whole point of them is that they are for, for everyone and forever. We're trying to conserve, but at the same time, there's always this sense of renewal going on and we're introducing new ideas and new thoughts. And they are where nature, beauty, history and people meet. Here's another classic example of nature, beauty, history and people meeting. This is the Anchorwick U, which um, is just south of the River Thames, fairly near London. Um, this is where it's about 2,500 years old, this, this U. So there's, there's some amazing support for nature there. It's obviously a historic tree. And in the Tudor area, this is allegedly where King Henry VIII was wooing Anne Boleyn. So King Henry VIII is one of our more famous kings, notorious for having six wives. And Anne Boleyn was unfortunately, sadly, the one that ma didn't manage to produce him a son, so had her head chopped off. Um, but he <laughs> allegedly, he proposed to her under this tree. So again, it's one of those things that I think it's a very beautiful tree. It's very old. It's got a lot of history and uh, a particular couple used to meet there all the time. So it's a classic example of, all these different dimensions of why records can be so important because that the stories that you can then produce from those records are just can be incredible um, as well as you know botanically interesting. So why records are important, here's some of the some of the reasons why they are. They help us be expert custodians to 
to look after what we have and to understand what we have is, is one of the primary things. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. It also helps us then, records help us monitor what we have, to find it again, to manage it, to, you know, all the pest and disease uh, issues, the pruning, the propagation, etc., to conserve it, to restore it, to succession plan it, to comply with any legislation associated with it, whether that be for plant movement or for um, wild collected material. Records also help us then support broader conservation, whether that be, you know, research that we're doing ourselves in our own gardens or as part of wider conservation initiatives, multi-garden initiatives, um, and to publicise those and publish that, um, that research. And also, most important, they help us share plants with people to display them, to label them correctly, to interpret them, um, to tell stories, about, to educate where that might be within our own um, objectives of our, of our organisations. They help us reveal unknown histories. How often have we found a, a little gem of a piece of information in an old book that we were unaware of until we, till we found it out that, that we can then share with other people and answer queries from the public and from other gardens. So records have many, many different purposes. And one of the most vital things for us all to consider when we're trying to create a record is we can't do all this at once. So which are the aspects um, that we really want to focus on that are important to our particular garden? And for me, that differs across the trust depending on the garden that I'm looking at. And I'm sure it will differ for you as an audience today. But the most important thing to come back to is to understand primarily what it is that we care for, because once we have that fundamental understanding, then the appropriateness of the records stems from that. So here are some of the ways that we think about significance in the trust that um, may prompt some ideas for you. You may think of it in completely different ways, but just some, some ideas. We have kind of over the last few years grouped some of our thinking into five different categories. The first category is how significant or valuable is each particular plant to the landscape or the actual layout of the garden or spirit of place? And spirit of place is a UNESCO term um, used to help quantify the actual distinctiveness and, and value of an individual location or, or space. Um, so how much does the plants that you have in your garden contribute to that landscape? Here I have a, a picture of Durgan Maze, which is a, one of our gardens down in Cornwall. Um, and it's an incredibly iconic um, set of plants, obviously not just one plant, uh, that really, uh, you can see it's, it's set up on one side of the valley and you can see it in its hole from the other side of the valley, as well as can wander around and get lost. It's very iconic. It's absolutely associated with the garden and we would consider it to be very, very significant historically that we would want to maintain it in its you know, existing form. Um, another category is that might be significant for history or cultural reasons. Uh, these could be early or original introductions, original cultivars, other um, subject, where a plant was first bred and planted. They could be plants associated with a famous person or events like the Isaac Newton's apple tree and um, the Anchorwick yew, or plants with a specific garden association. Do you have plants that are named after your garden or named after a person who owned your garden? Were their favourite plants? Um, horticulture. We have obviously various plants that are rare in cultivation and I think Lucy's going to talk a bit more about that in in the moment. Um, we have plants of exceptional or atypical form. In the in the UK we have an organisation that goes out and measures all of our trees to see who's the tallest, who's the, uh, the largest girth um, and we call those champions. We can have other exceptional plants, really classic examples of, of a, a, a particular cultivar at its peak. There's value for wild plant conservation. So species of known wild, or wild origin, which are at risk in the wild. So either on the IUCN red list or a local red list. Um, and then keeping records of plants that are within 
in situ or ex situ conservation programs always you know sort of vitally important if that is part of the mission for your garden to to make sure that those plants are for the best purpose that they can within any larger research and uh, conservation program and then finally in in the uk we have a huge number of ancient and veteran trees that we we care for um, and so they are providing value for nature they're supporting you know oak trees uh, in the uk can support up to 400 different other species um, so plants that are providing significant diversity value for us so just some ways of thinking about why you're creating records, why records are so important. All of these stories um, can, can then help you understand your collection and share it and protect it. So then how on earth do you decide where to start? Um, there's, it's, it depends, it's, it's the shortest answer. In the UK, we have, a, we have a saying, how long is a piece of string? Or which, which basically is trying to articulate that it really does depend on the scope of what you are trying to do within your garden. There are obviously the basics um, that we should be keeping, ideally, for every plant that is of some significance to yourselves. Um, and the, rather than use uh, technical terms, um, there's, a, there's an author called Rid Kipling who has a great poem. He says, I have six um, honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. They are what and why and when and how and where and who. And I think that's the basics for any good record. What is it? Why do you have it? When did you get it? How did you propagate it? Where, where is it? Um, and involved in planting it or um, is associated with that that plant. So if you could cover those basics, you're kind of starting from the right point. But the most important thing, going back to the understanding what you need, and not trying to record everything, um, only record the essentials. Every one of you will probably know of a records project that you have may have started or that you're aware of where no one ever quite got to the end of it. They've they set themselves great ambitions and, and never really completed it. So my biggest set of advice to you would be to, to work out what is the bare minimum that you need in order to be able to meet the objectives of the garden that you're working in. Have a look at what similar gardens to you are doing, what tools they're using. Um, and I've got a couple of links to some, to some starting points for research for that um, on my final slide. Um, create a plan. So one of the, the words in the title of this talk is to manage, and it is all about management. Um, don't do everything at once and really plan what you're going to do before you start rather than leaping in and thinking you're going to be able to, to record everything about everything. Set yourself some basic standards for data and how you're going to document things. Decide what system to use. Now, there are quite a few systems out there. The images on the right are of um, Iris BG um, and uh, Floria, which are both tools that we happen to use in the trust. But there's many, many more um, from BG Base to Portis to um, Brahms. And as I say, the link will take you to uh, a number of those. Um, and I'm sure that will be shared with you. Um, at the very basic, you can still run a plant record system if you're a small garden in a Google, a free Google spreadsheet. It doesn't need to be rocket science. Um, and some of the, you know, if you think back to some of the records we are all using still, um, paper records will have a place um, and can be, it depends. Again, it depends. What is the purpose of your record? Who's going to use it? Who wants to look at it? How are you going to, to um, use that combined data in the future? Um, but I personally built a records database that is in current use for a nature conservation organization 
in Google Spreadsheets. So don't always think that you absolutely need to spend a lot of money to do records well. Final bullet under four is just to create really clear processes for how you're going to capture the record and maintain it and how you're going to use it. Who's going to do what? Again, it doesn't need to be rocket science. It can just be very simple um, ownership of each stage in, in making sure that not only do you try and record everything, but that you have processes and resources in place to keep it up to date. Um, and an acronym that many of you are probably very well aware of, but uh, that hopefully is, is useful in this context, is to just ensure, take a step back and ensure that your management plan for your records is smart. Where are you going to start? Again, don't try and do everything at once. So pick an area of the garden that is most important to you or a subject matter that crosses the whole garden. Make sure it's measurable. Can you finish it? Or is it a never ending thing? Um, try try to, to set it up so that you're setting yourself up for success. Is it achievable? Do you have the, the resources? If it's not you, is there somebody else who would love doing records? Um, do you have the tools, skills, knowledge that you need to accurately create and maintain those records? Is it relevant? Is this the most important set of records for your garden? And when are you going to finish? Try and set an end date so that, again, you make something achievable rather than an open-ended um, project that you will then um, struggle, perhaps, to finish with all the other competing needs of a garden. So rather than go into all of that in great detail, um, my final slide, I've just got two sort of starting points for research and one of them is the BGCI manual chapter five in particular takes you through an awful lot of inf fantastic information around records and around systems that you use including a glossary of some of the key terms and the second bullet links to um, plant network obviously Rebecca is um, partnering with us on on this Day's webinar um, and they have a plant records forum and there's a lot of information there um, from meetings that are going back years with presentations and ideas that would be a great starting point for you when you were thinking about records in your gardens. Thank you so much Alison that was really interesting and I So Lucy Pittman, who I know from another context as well, works for the World Kitchen Garden Network too. So welcome today. You have your plant heritage hat on. Uh, so if you could share your screen and tell us a bit about plant heritage and, and in the UK and also how it fits in with what we've been talking about so far. I think you've been with us all day. So there's certain reflections, I think, on comments that have been made earlier. So take it away. Lovely. Thank you, Kate. And it's been wonderful being here all day, actually. And it's um, very grateful to be invited to add in what we do at Plant Heritage with the National Plant Collections in Britain and Ireland. So I'm Lucy Pittman. My job title is Plant Conservation Officer. Um, I'm one of two at um, Plant Heritage among the conservation team. My remit is specifically for the National Plant Collections. Um, the collections coordinators, we have regional coordinators of about 40 volunteers around Britain and Ireland. And um, that's yeah, my main role in the organization. So I'd just like to give you a bit of background to plant heritage as it stands today. Um, okay. Hopefully. Oh, Kate, I can't move on my screen. Oh, there we go. Sorry, thank you. So the National Plant Collections had um, an unexpected start. Um, it all evolved from a meeting um, based or th through the IUCN, which was founded in 1947. And in the 1970s, conservationists were becoming increasingly concerned about pressures on wild habitats, loss of plant species in the wild. Um, there was also recognition that the situation was actually not much better for cultivated plants. So even, you know, at this point, people were recognizing that plants were 
cultivated plants that have been used in gardens and in th and in floristry and things like that were disappearing um, and a significant part of our horticultural heritage across across Europe um, was going to vanish forever. So a conference was held at Kew in 1975 and 76. The relevant meeting for in this context was looking at the functions of living plant collections in conservation and conservation orientated research and public education. Okay. So in 1978, on the back of that meeting, uh, various members who had attended that from Kew and the RHS, Royal Horticultural Society here, um, and others, um, convened a new conference under the Royal Horticultural Society to bring together the organisations in Britain interested in the conservation and preservation of cultivated plants and to consider Oh, sorry, and could the practical role of gardens in the conservation of rare and threatened plants. Um, and there were over 100 representatives uh, at this meeting from across the um, horticulture industry. And this became initially an idea for the founding of Gardens and Plants Council. Um, this would have been a national body, a national organization functioning close to that of the Arts Council, which does still exist. However, um, it felt that it wasn't going to quite fit what the remit of this organization should be. So what had been an idea for a new Arts Council became the National Council for the Conservation of Plants and Gardens. And in the first five years, Gardens and Plants Steering Committee was set up charitable status was established and funding found. Uh, a membership scheme was also set up with 35 groups, regional groups across the UK, uh, 29 of which are still running today. And the council itself was set up with representatives from these groups. So, um, and the first employee, a uh, horticultural taxonomist was taken on in 1980. Um, of the original collections accredited, so these first collections uh, through the pilot scheme, the first collections were accredited between 1981 and 1982. By 1982, there were 57 national, nationally accredited plant collections across Britain and Ireland. And today, November 2022, we have 696 accredited national plant collections across approximately 400 locations. Um, some of these original sites still have their, uh, still hold national collection, in fact, um, and these include organisations like the National Trust for Scotland, the National Trust um, that Alison works for, um, the Hillier Arboretum, RHS Gardens at Wisley and at Rosemore, Paint and Zoo, zoological societies actually came quite high on the list in the early days and still do in some cases, Fergus Croft, Western Bert Arboretum and the Cambridge Botanic Gardens. So let's move on. The long name, the National Council for the Conservation of Plants and Gardens was not a useful working title. So the title of Plant Heritage was taken on as a, as a working uh, title for the organization in 2009. In 2018, the organization was entirely rebranded as Plant Heritage, which became the official name of the charity. Um, I'll just, just very quickly, the background to how collections are run. All national plant collections are accredited. They go through a process um, of application um, that comes before a plant collections committee. This is this is and always has been actually an independent committee responsible for the accreditations made up of professional horticulturalists, botanists, taxonomists, nurserymen, collection holders, gardeners from all from many of the original. Um, uh, horticulturalist uh, organizations and people from industry that established the organization at the beginning. Um, in 2013, the system changed slightly and three collection categories um, were implemented to focus on the scope or how collections could be set up. And in 2015, approximately, um, we established our own plant records database specifically for and designed for National plant collections. Um, yeah, all collections have to meet specific curation standards, 
that they can now include smaller groups within a genus. So not all collections have to be hundreds of plants. Um, so holding a national plant collection being collection holders uh, become has become a far more achievable aim for 2021. So the collection categories that sit um, within the national plant collections uh, reference, which are much closer to the original older collections, these tend to be the biggest and most generically complete of plants uh, in UK and Ireland. Historical collections, which I'll come back to, and horticultural, horticultural collections, which historic and horticultural sit often side by side. Some could be in both um, categories. We tend to ask them to choose one. Um, so there we are, and the Pacific Flora is an example of a reference. The irises of John D. Taylor, a much, much smaller collection, but very specialist in is under historical. And Monada, wonderful collection down in the west of Wales. So we've heard the, the phrase living library before. Um, the national plant collections in here have been described as living libraries. When to describe what they are, people know what zoos are. Animals are kept in zoos to protect them, to breed from, to return to the wild where there's threat to habitats and things. Um, and these plant collections tend to be the same. There's a lot of what's called plant blindness um, that goes on, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. So just as an example of how these collections operate, really, um, relatively new collections of um, Dryopteris and Polysticum cultivars were re-established in an amazing uh, ravine, so a, a rocky garden down in Devon. Um, the historic ferns had disappeared over time, so an existing collection holder with an extraordinarily large collection of ferns helped them at Canantain to, re to, to set up this, these two collections. Um, there's still the Arons cultivar collection bred by George Arons at Georg, sorry, um, at, at Wisley, was helped to come to life from another collection holder in Devon, long established collection. Um, um, Malcolm Farrow, who set up that collection about 40 years ago, has personal collections for the Arons family in Germany. So his research helped to set up this collection at Wisley. And then other collections like the wonderful Gallica roses um, at Carroll side, which is up in the Scottish borders. The garden already existed and the collection of roses already existed. So um, Rose Foyle, who owns it, um, was encouraged to register her amazing collection as a national collection under the scheme. We come to historic collections. These are incredibly varied some large, some small, um, and most of them, well, all of them, um, relate to personal interest of somebody involved with the collections. Um, the, Chrysan the Crocus collection um, at Middleton House in near London uh, includes plants raised by E.A. Bowles. Then we have Sir Michael Foster introductions. Lucy Scallon's collection, um, was established when she did, the family discovered that her great grandfather was Sir Michael Foster, the extraordinary iris breeder. So she decided to do some research, which eventually evolved into her establishing a national collection. Same with the Backhouse cultivars up in Scotland at the Rossi estate, Caroline um, Thompson, who lives there. Her family is the Backhouse family. And she started doing research into her family, which took off and became a huge collection. And the research is, carries on. They found diaries recently from one James Backhouse, which he's now working with. Um, the tulip collection, historic tulips. This is a new collection again of the um, florists and breeders tu tulips that were part of the tulip mania in the 16th century, which uh, Lenica alluded to earlier. But seeing these wonderful, wonderful images that look like Rembrandt paintings, Fabulous collection. And then Ellen Wilmot, extraordinary gardener and, and uh, horticulturalist from history. Uh, Nick Stanley was working on a different collection as a, a group collection. Um, and he became fascinated by Ellen Wilmot's life and history. So he set up 
a collection of plants named for and associated with Ellen Wilmot. And over on the side, the amazing Bloody Ploughman, fabulous name for an apple. Um, it was first found at Meginch Castle up in Scotland near Perth. And um, the lady who currently owns um, is incumbent uh, in at Meginch Castle decided to look further into her, the heritage of the fruit from their gardens and established a Scottish heritage apple and pear collection up there. It's wonderful to visit actually. So how many collections are there? I've just pulled out a small example of the numbers of collections for different genera. And when it comes to looking for plants for historic gardens, they're an amazing number to start with and they're fascinating and wonderful people that work with them. Um, but national collections come and go. People retire as national collection holders. The collections are then withdrawn or passed on. So these are just some examples of collections currently in the scheme. Um, as you can see, the roses from 19th century, shrub roses, alba roses, the gallicas we saw earlier that are up in Scotland, um, right down to Spinosissima roses, the Scots roses and hybrids. The Narcissus, mostly historic collections, as you can see. And the Primula auricula, I oh, was delighted to see a beautiful drawing of the Primula auricula in uh, Lenica's uh, talk at the beginning. Very historical. I think, I'm not sure, I might be wrong, uh, but I believe the border auriculas were used um, considerable time ago in gardens. The auricular theatre, this lovely picture is actually at um, Colt Abbey. They don't have a national collection, but I couldn't resist putting this amazing image in. There aren't very many of these built um, auricular theatres left anymore. Go and visit, it's wonderful. And then we have collections that work directly alongside restoration projects. And actually it was wonderful hearing Mark Laird this morning talk about Paints Hill Park, the work that went into um, the, the, the research and work that went into that um, garden. He mentioned briefly John Bartram. There is actually, having set up the, um, having done all the restoration work and reintroduced plants at Paints Hill, um, they were invited to register the John Bartram tree collection as a national collection under um, plant heritage, um, which I believe was registered in uh, 2009. I might have got that wrong, but hopefully not. So wonderful seeing that there. And again, a brilliant example of, of a, a garden restored and then the collection coming forward as a national collection. In the case at Benton End, Benton End was the garden of the artist, uh, Sir Cedric Morris and Sarah Cook, uh, a few years ago started collecting Cedric Morris um, introductions, Iris introductions. She's now working with the Garden Museum in London and the Benton and Trust in Suffolk in east of England to re-establish his garden with his own introductions. Wonderful project and uh, again another one to go to visit when it's open. It's not quite open, that's work um, currently ongoing. Um, I hope I'm all right for time, Kate. I forgot to put my, my clock on. So, collections and gardens. Ornamental and garden plants lost and found. I wasn't quite sure how to, how to put that. We've heard earlier already that um, fashions change, plants go out of fashion, they disappear. Um, there's always changes in the, tra in, in, in the trade. Um, supermarkets, garden centres, they have to focus on what the what plants they can sell and how they can sell them best. So ranges change and we lose plants out of that system. We also lose smaller plant, uh, specialist plant nurseries for many reasons, retirement um, costs and things like that. Climate change we've already alluded to, again, will affect the range of cultivated plants we have. Um, pests and disease, new pathogens. I'm not going to go into all of that. I think we all know across Europe what um, huge issues there are at the moment. Um, and training and skills, which of course is what this um, series of webinars and, and uh, is, is all about, uh, recognising the lack and loss of horticultural skills and the training that we just don't have enough of in horticulture currently. 
So I'm just going to come to the Threat and Plants program. Oh, I think I might have missed a, sorry, gone too far. So in um, 2009, um, Plant Heritage recognized um, that there was a place to set up a system to find plants that were lost, plants threatened in cultivation, and how to locate and record the old cultivars, including in, of course, in national plant collections. Um, so, so to mitigate the loss, um, we are, so I apologize, uh, Threatened Plants Program combines data from the RHS Plant Finder, which shows the availability of availability of plants through hundreds of UK nurseries from 1987 to the present day, uh, with records for the National Plant Collections and other schemes under plant heritage, and cultivar lists from more than 2,000 botanic, 2, botanic and historic gardens in the UK and Ireland, which we have um, agreement with, to use their information, uh, but not publish it. Um, so, work also carries on um, in conservation organizations like the National Trust, the National Trust of Scotland, among others, recognize the importance of historic gardens, but also the plants that were in those gardens and are in those gardens. And the national collect collections pay, play an important role in establishing the social and cultural history surrounding gardens. Um, the picture of the dianthus that I have down here at the bottom is in a collection of Malmaison dianthus held in Suffolk by Jim Marshall. In France in the 1860s, 20 cultivars were produced under the Malmaison, in the Malmaison group. Today, only five of those still exist and they are held in the national collection. So one of the issues going back to why plants disappear is uh, uh, propagation skills. And for example, this plant can now only be produced virus-free by micropropagation. Micro Okay. So the Threatened Plants Program, my colleague Kalani Seymour, who's actually here today as well watching, so Kalani, I hope I'm not making too many errors. Um, the plants can be considered as critical in cultivation, endangered in cultivation, or vulnerable in cultivation in a similar way to the IUCN program red, for the Red List uh, works. Um, but the Threatened Plants program looks exclusively at cultivars. The IUCN cover threat status for species. Um, through the TPP, um, the program, we track the locations and availability of garden cultivars and work out how rare or threatened they may be. If a cultivar has been grown or sold in the UK or Ireland for more than 10 years ago, for more than 10 years, but is now no longer consistently grown or for sale through nurseries, it can be considered as threatened in cultivation and will appear in one of these categories. This is a lovely, I had to put in this uh, quote, um, Kalani did a huge amount of work for uh, Bedgebury Pine Eaton um, to evaluate the threat status of some of their collections. And this comment from Dan just um, shows very clearly how the project can actually be a huge benefit to gardens and, um, and parks and arboreta to put a value on cultivars because they know how rare they are, uh, incredibly important. And just at the bottom here is some little pelagonium, Sussex Delight, considered critical, threatened critical uh, in cultivation, was listed in the RHS plant finder between 1996 and 2012 is now no longer available except in uh, private collections. Okay, I might have rattled through that a bit quickly, but I hope um, if anybody has any questions, um, you'll ask. Um, we're not alone in plant heritage. There are other organizations across Europe and the rest of the world that have a, a national collection uh, networks and just a few of these here in Germany, Netherlands, and France. Some of you I'm sure will know all of these. And in the rest of the world, Australia, Japan, and the United States, Australia and Japan, both set up their um, organizations on the based on what we do here in the UK, which is a huge honor. 
but it means it, it indicates how important plant collections can be. Um, and if I have missed in it, I know there are no national plant collections in Belgium, but I'm afraid I don't know about all of Scandinavia. So hopefully you will let me know. Um, so thank you. I hope I haven't rushed through that too fast. And um, please ask us questions. Thank you, Kate. That's great. Thank you very much, Lucy. I'm going to ask everyone to save their questions to the end of the session. So we've got two more speakers and then we can all have a bit of a panel discussion with anyone else who's still The next speaker is from Sweden, Linnea. I'll just say a little bit about you. Um, so you are um, representing, you're the curator of the Gene Bank um, at the Swedish National, um, well, not the National Collection. You, you probably better explain the difference. If you've just watched Lucy, it seemed to me that plant heritage spreads its collections throughout uh, England and, and Ireland, whereas it would seem to me that in Sweden, things are kept centrally. Is that right? Or have I misunderstood? Perhaps you can explain. Um, yes, we have a central collection, but we also have local clonal archives spread over Sweden. So mm. I hope it's clearer after this presentation. Okay. Uh, well, um, as Kate uh, said in the introduction, my name is uh, Linnea Oskarsson and I work as a Dean Bank curator for ornamental perennials at the Swedish National Dean Bank. And this is Signe. Here she's sitting to, to the right of the bride and groom in this photo from 1939. It is her daughter Gunvor who is getting married. In the middle of the photo, in front of the wedding couple, you can see a peony. And this one, Signe, planted it here in 1923, when she and her husband had finished building the house in the background and had just moved in. The peony came from Signe's parents' home, just a short distance away, and Signe was very proud of this peony. She used to say that this plant was not to be touched ever. This peony was unique. So the only thing that has happened to this plant since 1923 is that the small fence around the plant has been improved. Today it is Signa's granddaughter who grows the peony and she faithfully follows Signa's advice to fertilize it every year with moose droppings from the forest behind the house. And today, the peony has actually been divided once when Signa's granddaughter sent a division of it to the nationwide inventory of older ornamental perennials that was started in Sweden in 2003. So today, both this peony and its history are preserved in the Swedish National Gene Bank for vegetatively propagated horticultural crops, or the Swedish National Gene Bank, as we say for short. The National Gene Bank is Sweden's gene bank for heritage garden plants, and the plants preserved here have been cultivated in Sweden for 70 years or more. The gene bank was opened in 2016, so even if the plants kept here are old, the gene bank in itself only turned six years this summer. The gene bank is state funded and it's located at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Alnarp, just outside the city of Malmö in the south of Sweden. All in all, 2,300 accessions are preserved in the gene bank. The collection consists of both fruit, berries, vegetables and ornamentals, such as roses, perennials, trees, bulbs and pot plants. The collection includes both local Swedish cultivars, cultivars developed by Swedish plant breeders, and foreign cultivars with a long history of cultivation in Sweden. Since we work with vegetatively propagated plants, 
the Swedish National Dean Bank is a so-called field dean bank. This means that the plants are preserved as uh, living, growing, full-size plants planted in long rows. All the seeds are cut away and thrown away to avoid loss of cultivars due to cross-pollination. The gene bank is five hectares or 50,000 square meters in size. And today we will focus on this area of the gene bank. Here you find the ornamental perennials and this is where I spend most of my days. The perennial collection consists of 470 different accessions, which together represent 150 different species and hybrids. What they all have in common is that they have been grown in Sweden since before 1940, and that they all have a documented history of where they were grown and by whom. These perennials, like all plants preserved in the gene bank, were collected through large nationwide inventories conducted in the early 2000s. The inventories were run by the Programme for Diversity of Cultivated Plants, POM. This is the Swedish National Programme for Plant Genetic Resources and is organised as a network, including national authorities, the plant breeding sector, NGOs, botanical gardens, growers associations, open air museums and many more. The program started in the year 2000 as a result of Sweden signing the UN Convention on Biological Diversity in 1993. POM's first assignment was to search for old garden plant cultivars. This assignment was prioritized because there was a risk that these cultivars would otherwise disappear. Many had already been lost and now it was important to find those that remained. To find these old cultivars still in cultivation, POM started eight uh, inventory projects or calls for old plants. They started between 2002 and 2009. One of them was the call for perennials or perennopropet in Swedish, where we were looking for ornamental uh, perennials grown before 1940. The call started in 2003. The question we all asked ourselves before we started was, would there be any old perennials left? Were we too late? We worked in two different ways to try to find these plants. We made a call to the general public. We also trained persons who made inventories for us. The call was spread through TV, radio, garden fairs and articles in newspapers and magazines. And to the left you see, an ex to the right you see an example of such an article. And this one was published in two 2005 and the headline says wanted ornamental plants with a history. In all articles, radio features and so on, we asked garden owners with perennials with a history dating back to 1940 or earlier to write us a letter or an email describing the plant and the history connected to it. I. Uh, also trained 110 persons all over Sweden who helped us making inventories of perennials to uh, track them down, describe them and report them to the call. The persons making inventories were of different ages and with different backgrounds. They were often private persons, but there were also people who worked professionally with plants. They all worked in different ways to find these plants, but all worked unpaid without any economical compensation. One thing that became apparent during this inventory was that it was with the older women in Sweden that these plants were found. 
when we introduced the call for perennials, we expected there would be more, more old cultivars to be found in nurseries and in public parks and gardens. But most of the nurseries active in Sweden in the early 20th century uh, were are closed and uh, parks had often been redone in several rounds. So it was thanks to the older women that these perennials were still in cultivation. When I started working with the inventory in 2003, it was women born in the 1920s and 1930s who contacted the call. The perennials they grew were often perennials that had been passed down from one generation to the next, often from mother to daughter or from mother-in-law to daughter-in-law. What was really touching was uh, the way these women had cared for their plants. They were precious to them since they often reminded them of the persons from whom they had received them, or they reminded them of an event where the perennials played a certain role. Perhaps a wedding where you had a, a perennial in your bridal bouquet, or perhaps you received a plant from someone when you were newly married and moved to your own first home. These stories connected to the perennials had not been written down earlier. Instead, they were passed on orally between generations. Up until 2011, we got tips on 7,000 perennials from all across Sweden. This was much more than we ever dared to hope for. All letters and tips were reviewed by an expert group consisting of botanists, representatives of nurseries, open air museums, recreational growers and gardening schools. And this is a photo of the expert group in 2015. We met twice a year uh, during the entire inventory phase and decided together on 1,100 perennials we wanted to trial cultivate. The trial cultivation of perennials took place at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Alnarp between 2006 and 2015. During this phase, we got divisions of the plants sent to us. I then contacted all the donors one more time to see if the history of the plant really went back as far as 1940. We also described all the cultivars with descriptors, and I tried to sort out which accessions were duplicates. We also tried to see if we could bring any perennials to known cultivars. In 2015, after several years of trial cultivation, the expert group met once more and decided on the 470 different accessions of perennials that were to be conserved in the gene bank. The perennials came from all parts of Sweden, from the farthest north to the farthest south. This was important to us to try to preserve the diversity of perennials from all parts of Sweden. Among the 470 perennial accessions, there were over 150 different species and hybrids. The distribution of the most frequent genera looks like this. And peonies uh, were the perennial most people thought of when they read the call, and we got a lot of tips on peonies. Ground cover plants were the trickiest ones to find. All perennials on this list are often used in herbaceous borders and flower beds, so they are well known and very loved in Sweden. The oldest perennial in the gene bank so far is this peony, Peonia festiva, from uh, Teranemo in the western parts of Sweden. This particular accession can be traced all the way back to 1840, and has been passed down in the same family for seven generations. This particular peony, we can say, is of the cultivar Rubra Plena, 
but in the vast majority of cases, we couldn't match the plant we received with a known cultivar name. In those cases, we have given the plant a new cultivar name. These names are inspired by the traditions, stories and local names attached to the plants. For an example, this uh, garden phlox was named Alma Jansson to honor the farmer's wife Alma Jansson in the middle of this picture, who lived with her husband, eight children and a mother-in-law in a small farmyard in Uppland in the middle of Sweden and who grew this garden phlox for more than 40 years. The, pom the plants from POMS large inventories are not only preserved in the Dean Bank in Alnarp, but also at so-called local clonal archives all around Sweden. These are public gardens who, uh, in cooperation with the Dean Bank, grow and preserve backup copies of the plants in the Dean Bank. In the central collection in Alnarp, we grow at least two plants of each accession, but we also send out two plants of each accession to the local clonal ar archive responsible for the area where the plant was collected. So, for example, plants from the island of Gotland are preserved at the National Dean Bank in Alnarp, but two plants of each accession um, are also sent to the Botanical Garden in uh, Gotland. In this way, we can get plants back if they were to disappear from us and vice versa. The local clonal archives also display and present the old garden plants to the public. In the local clonal archives, you can get to know the plants, study them and, for example, go to guided tours and be told the story behind them. We are also working uh, on making the plants available to everyone who is interested. We do this through the trademark Grönt Kulturarv. This translates as Green Heritage. This trademark is a collaboration between POM and the nurseries in Sweden. Under this trademark, we bring out the most valuable of what was collected so that the plants can be bought in commercial gardens and garden centers. The trademark was registered in 2011 by the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and the first plants were put on the market by the nurseries in 2013. Today, there are over a hundred cultivars to buy under this trademark. Both uh, roses, bulbs, shrubs, trees, perennials, kitchen plants and pot plants. They have been much appreciated both by private garden owners and public parks and gardens especially the cultivar names and the opportunity to read the story of the cultivars are appreciated. The history are presented on the POMS webpage. So to sum up, the Swedish National Programme for Plant Genetic Resources, POM, asked all uh, residents of Sweden for help to find perennials grown here since before 1940. 470 accessions were selected and are now conserved in the Swedish National Gene Bank. Now we are working on making the cultivars available to researchers, breeders and historical gardens, for example. We are also working on making them available to the general public in the form of the plants that are launched under the trademark Green Heritage. In this way, everyone can contribute to keeping the cultivars alive. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you very much, Linnea. That was absolutely amazing. I love the way that you managed to get um, the general public involved with this project. 
Um, it just shows how much gardens go to the heart of, of so many people. Now, welcome our final speaker, uh, Professor Cassian Schmidt uh, from the wonderful Hermanshof Gardens. And um, I had the uh, wonderful opportunity to visit the gardens a few years ago and was really, really impressed. Um, and I think sort of somewhat controversially, we're going to be asking you to tell us all about the, the new German style of planting there, which um, would seem to go against a lot of what we're talking about with authentic historic planting, but you have some very interesting reasons uh, for doing this and some very interesting results. So please, could you share your screen? Yes. Um, we will <coughs> be enlightened. Uh, one moment. <clears throat> so it should be full screen now right yes perfect. perfect thank you so kate thank you very much for your introduction and i'm really impressed uh, by the lecture of uh, uh, linea that was really even if i heard it already but it's always impressive these systems we are still a little bit away from this uh, but in my talk i will uh, emphasize on uh, you know the the modern way to uh, to uh, deal with a historic a garden which heavens of actually is and uh, to continue an approach an always involving approach for the future i was also <laughs> quite um, astonished that there was a new uh, there was a german style already what uh, um, uh, Maria mentioned this morning, but now we are talking about the new German style. Well, uh, just an area view of the garden settled in the beautiful mountains of the uh, Odenwald. It's a quite sheltered area, zone 8A, and we have a beautiful herit heritage of uh, uh, specimen trees. If you see here, one of the oldest is 240 years uh, also, the garden was already established in the uh, 18th century, even before, but there are no plants left. And um, I will talk only about the newest development uh, since the 1920s and especially um, uh, after the 1980s. So uh, five uh, bullet points. First, about the history. Uh, of the garden and the influences, uh, the innovation, the concept of the habitat-based sustainable planting design, which is uh, summarized uh, with the term New German style, the inspiration, natural vegetation, so we are thinking about plant communities, uh, which is quite unusual also for a trial garden, because usually you try plants separate from each other, as we heard before, we do that also, but uh, it's uh, about interacting of plants. And maintenance is a very, very important strategy for us to reduce the maintenance without losing quality, uh, because our main emphasis is also to, to trial things for the public agree. And this is point five, just uh, only very short, the so-called random planting style. Some, you know, because we are in a in historic and we heard so many uh, and I was so impressed. I'm not a his garden historian, uh, but of course, uh, as a landscape architect, I know about uh, the different styles. And so to, to get you back to the early 1920s, we have heard about the, uh, um, um, the uh, Teppichbeete, uh, which was also in Germany about that time a little bit earlier around the 1980s but this was just on the edge uh, when there came a lot of influence also from England but this is the old style garden before uh, the second generation of the Frodenberg industrial family uh, moved into the manor house which is still the same today 
There was a lot of vineyards here on the below the castles, which is now all woodland, and it was a, a family vegetable uh, and fruit orchard garden. This is the family. There were three generations actually living in the house, and you see still around this time there was something left of this uh, bedding plant with with all these exotic uh, plants. So it was a quite formal. Um, garden, so a little bit behind its time, I, I would suggest. And it was a typical industrial estate. Uh, the family lived here and had her garden. But there was an influence in starting in the 1920s, influenced by the art and crafts garden from England, especially Gravetie Manor, but also uh, others. Uh, Professor Wiebking Jürgen was one of the um, landscape architects in the 1920s. Um, he was also professor in uh, Hanover uh, University. He um, designed the garden in the 1920s, typical in this uh, formal way. And you see the influence of the English cottage garden, garden style with all the time was uh, between the uh, uh, paving and so on. So it, it was very, it was kind of formal, but perennials played a major role, of course. This was also the time when Carl Förster um, started. So there was a lot of influence about uh, perennials. And also you see there are plant communities already. Before in the 1920s, the garden looked totally different. It was still these kind of Victorian style. You see, it was a little bit, you know, uh, a lot of azaleas, which don't grow in our climates, actually. And uh, it, it was uh, a totally different. There were no plant communities and so on. It was a very uh, bright colored collection of azaleas and um, annual borders. And then the garden changed a lot after Professor Wippen Jürgensmann uh, took over the design that was in 1923, 24, and he was um, uh, responsible for the garden, or at, at least for the advice and consulting um, until the 1950s. So 40 years, actually, he consulted the family in the garden. And he redesigned it in the 1950s, but this is the early stage, um, the terrace, and you, you see plants are used as community, so um, they match habitat. And, and this whole approach uh, dates back actually to, to William Robinson, uh, who was uh, actually the first thinking about plant communities, uh, images of, uh, you know, like a woodland garden and so on. Um, um, not certainly the wild garden, which is often misinterpreted. But, you know, this was typical, this influence of England, but also from the German uh, uh, plant uh, socio so sociology science. Uh, so both influences, I guess, were uh, matched here. This is the garden uh, today or nowadays. You see still these very uh, um, um, specimen trees, old growth trees, which are all about 135 140 years old, mostly planted um, uh, in 1888, so with the first generation of um, the Freudenberg industrialist family. So we have this beautiful sequoia planted in 1888, also magnolia, um, sulangiana, uh, alba superba, which is also a, an old variety, not much sold anymore. And uh, so it's a really a, a legacy, a heritage, actually. And we try to keep these plants alive, which is not always uh, quite um, easy. And we have another heritage from the 1948, this beautiful Chinese redwood metasequoia um, came from Arnold Arboretum as seed uh, in 19. Uh, 47. This was the year when the first seed of uh, Metasequoia were in introduced from China to the West. And there are only three trees uh, originating from these first discovered trees, and one is in Hermannsdorf. It's now 45 
meters uh, tall. So quite an impressive um, tree. And um, also um, one of the most iconic uh, views is this um, walk of uh, uh, Visteria, which is actually, I found this out some years ago, which is originally um, inspired by the uh, Visteria walk in um, Grave Thai Manor, actually. There's an image in the book, uh, the wild garden from, uh, or the flower garden from William Robinson, and exactly this rhythm of, uh, it's not a pergola, it's like a walk, uh, it's exactly uh, the one, and I think Weep King visited um, Gravetar that we know, so he was probably inspired, and this is one of the heritage we, we, we have, and uh, it's a beautiful old growth planted in 1923, uh, probably some of the oldest wisterias in Germany, actually. There are two different ones, this is multi yuga and uh, so Floribunda, and this is Shainensis. Well, today, uh, totally different approach, uh, a naturalistic look. Uh, this is very typical for, um, to, sum the, to summarize the new germ style. But when I took over the garden in 1998, uh, it was a different style, actually. It was a little bit more formal. It was more or less intermingled. And nowadays I use really also uh, the bulbs, which are more in border area, but it's not a classic border. It's really like a landscape. I, I usually uh, think in landscape. So I reduce the amount of different varieties um, and it looks like a, uh, a, a random um, intermingled meadow actually. And of course, different color schemes. In the front, this is where I use um, double tulips. This is uh, the, the bedding, actually. This is the only part we change uh, twice a year. The rest uh, stays into the ground, but we replant. We're just now replanting about 12,000 um, bulbs uh, and about uh, eight, seven to 8,000 tulips. Usually the single laid we have to replant. And every year I do a different uh, summer um, bedding, which, which I call always the, the mill fleur style. Uh, so a little bit also historical inspired, but in a modern way, of course. And, uh, but these, these, uh, this intermingling I like with, with uh, connected uh, colors, uh, actually. Last year it was in warm colors, actually. So it looks like a historic border, but of course, it isn't, and it's not a border that fits to the time when to to the 1980s, to the 1880s, when when the house or the garden was first acquired. Uh, we have two historic houses: the the manor house where the family lived. It's now used for corporate functions from the industrialist um, uh, family, which is a still family-owned uh, company with 55,000 employees worldwide. And uh, they um, su supply about 75% uh, of the funding. And uh, the rest is funded by the town council of Wynam. This is my, this is the gardener's house, also historic from 1835. And um, uh, this is also uh, here I'm sitting now. Um, a little bit about effect of the gardens. It's quite well visited. We are in the southwest of Germany, near the, the romantic city of Heidelberg. We uh, usually attract about 150,000 visitors annually, which is quite a lot. I think Sissinghurst has, has over uh, 300,000, but for a small garden of 2.3 hectares, it's, it's quite a lot. And it's mainly privately funded, which is also quite unusual because these kind of trial gardens, scientific gardens are usually connected with universities or other research stations. So we are the one of the only ones uh, mainly privately um, funded. And of course, we are also a horticultural research institution with emphasis of uh, innovative planting design and especially low maintenance and ecolog uh, ecologically based perennial plantings. And we are, uh, this is the topic, a fine example of the 
new German style of planting. And education is also very important. So to transfer these ideas to young people, to the next generation, this is very important for me. We do also trials. Um, this is uh, in, in the nursery area. So we have a different area. Um, there's a connection of trial gardens, about 14 in the German speaking countries. And um, unfortunately these assortments, like especially like Sanguisorba, 55 varieties, we can't usually keep them. Uh, and there is no system installed yet. Um, um, there is a network of course, but uh, we, we are not able to transfer these plants from the trials, which are proved by experts true to name, and we always try to discover um, uh, or to prove the old varieties if they are true to name, but we are not able to, to spread all these assortments, uh, which are usually two every year, um, to, to uh, private organizations or a botanical garden. This is really a, a pity. Uh, we have a nursery area and uh, the garden itself, is separated by different habitats, which is the main idea of the new germ styles, matching plants to their garden um, habitats. And you see, this, this is the, the, the borders. We have rocky steppe, steppe, um, prairie, uh, steppe, uh, then um, um, woodland, European, Asian woodland, and North American woodland. So it's it's a combination of geographical um, plantings and um, um, habitat planting, actually. And the concept of this habitat-based sustainable planting design um, is uh, that we emphasize on year-round dynamical changes in visual expect, expects. Um, and uh, the, the, the key is bringing aesthetical and ecological aspects together. This is, I think, the, 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 the goal of the, um, um, the, the new German uh, style. And we call it um, the Lebensbereiche, the garden habitats, which were developed by Richard Hansen from the Weinstefan uh, Institute, which is fundamental actually also for, the, uh, for many other um, gardens. And um, so it's on one hand, natural habitat requirements, as well as uh, aesthetical quality. So both actually, it's not the, the wild garden in its uh, sense. So another area of view where you can imagine the different uh, border, these are the, the borders and these are the more wild areas. And uh, these uh, kind of habitats, are woodland, dry open ground, um, steppe, and uh, water. There are actually eight of these. And this fundamental book published first in uh, 1981, that was the uh, perennials and their garden habitats. It's also uh, translated in English, but I think it's out of print um, in the moment. But this is, we call it the, the Bible of uh, planting design and plant use in Germany. Where does it come from? Uh, Professor Richard Hansen was also involved in, uh, or his uh, professor was um, um, the, the famous uh, plant, um, um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, plant sociologist um, uh, Tuxen. And uh, so he was mapping uh, plant communities in Germany. He was the father actually of uh, plant communities. And Hansen, of course, took this system of plant communities to another level, uh, he adapted it to garden habitats. And this was really his uh, idea, but it was not actually, he was not the first. There was actually uh, Willy Lange, which also had this idea of um, reinventing uh, natural plant communities in a garden setting. And um, Willy Lange was also in, in, in influenced by William Robinson itself. So you see it starts all uh, at William Robinson, actually, this idea of putting plants together as a community. And in every catalog, actually, we were, this morning, there were some talks about uh, catalogs. And in every German catalog, uh, you have this information about the habitat and you have this 
kind of pictograms. And it was also new to me when a catalog got a guidebook also um, uh, for, uh, for planting and plant use actually. And this is very important in all German catalogs that you have these capitals um, and the, uh, the, these uh, little numbers are the, the moisture uh, uh, range uh, where you can use the plants. It's quite simple and it's, it's almost self-explaining, uh, uh, but this works very, very well um, in, in German catalog. And I think it's quite unique for the German-speaking um, countries and it's quite useful actually. And in, um, in Germany, uh, there was not a garden except Wein Stefan to prove this kind of garden habitats, to have it really installed. And that was in 1979 when uh, the Freudenberg family decided to open the garden to the public with the con concept of horticultural plant community uh, for city public green. And um, Richard Hansen recommended was Walser, which um, was the director of the garden of the garden before me. He was a student actually in Ryan Stefan University to do the first initial uh, planting design. Also, also so there is a continuous um, um, row of people. And to explain the new germ style, this term was actually um, applied by Stephen Lacey in 2002. And um, he and some other um, um, people from, from England uh, visited Germany 10 years earlier. So that was in, in the 1990s and were quite impressed about this naturalistic style, uh, which um, is dedicated to the, uh, to the growing condition, which was quite different from the English um, approach. And it was more informal, more intermingled with a lot more dynamics going on over the years. It was more meadow-like um, effect. And um, um, yeah, they were fascinated about these more ecological um, uh, processes and um, uh, about these new ideas um, going on to Germany. And this was quite influential. Um, I'm always a little critical to, to call it a style, um, <laughs> but um, it's actually a very unique approach. And it is more than putting plants together in, um, uh, according to the habitat. It's also according to, to their sociability because plants are social or unsocial. And this is a typical planting plan uh, for the new German uh, style kind of planting. Uh, you need symbols for that to show the, the grouping, the distribution uh, of plants. And you see also that plants intermingle, they step out of their groups and so on. So it's very different from drifts and all these English kind of uh, planting uh, style. And it, it, it evokes a very dynamic, uh, you know, almost self-sustaining um, uh, aspect. Of course, it has to be controlled in a way by maintenance, but it looks very spontaneous, actually. And to show this, uh, you see different levels of sociability in, in, in the step of planting. Uh, the the stepas are sticking out and you have lower plants and um, different um, uh, levels of sociability to form an interacting plant community. And of course, there is also layers of time. And this is also important. This is the same planting in spring with a lot of uh, these uh, Clusiana tulips, which I really uh, like. And uh, they're not so long lived uh, usually, but uh, they are nicely presented in here. So these layers in time are also very important in the new germ style. This is the summer and the dry steppe hillside. And usually every planting is dedicated to a to a really realistic plant community. It's, it's of course not a replica uh, of a plant community, but it has the sense and character of a wild plant community, like here, a steppe or a Mediterranean um, uh, hillside. And also here with subshrubs, this, this typical Mediterranean character, a garic planting, or like this with cystus. 
So uh, usually I'm inspired really by seeing these things in nature. And then I uh, try to point out the most important features and facts to, to mimic this kind of plant community. And of course, I, I'm not totally geographically exact, uh, but the feeling should come over the color range also with like this acid yellow and, and magenta, which is very typical for this garrigue um, uh, type of vegetation in the Mediterranean. Woodland, the European woodland, uh, more based on textures. North American woodland, quite fantastic with the dogwoods. Um, um, I, I lived a few, um, one year in Maryland and, and of course I wanted to have a, a Maryland East Coast uh, corner with Camarcia. So it's, it's much more colorful than the European um, woodland. And the Asian woodland with this uh, misty uh, mood and it's very uh, subtropical. Uh, this is in China and also this woodland um, I try to, to uh, mimic um, in the garden with more bold textures plants so that everybody who moves through these kind of plantings get touched, get in different um, mood or um, inspiration about going through this even without any explanation. You feel you know, that the Mediterranean planting is totally different from a lush um, Asian woodland planting. Even these plants are not all Asian. This is a North American magnolia, um, uh, but it doesn't matter. It's just the, the mood of the thing. So I'm not 100% exact in these things. So, and also sometimes, very rarely, I use some variegated plants, especially here, it, sh it should emphasize on this exotic feeling of a um, Chinese woodland. Uh, of course, these plantings are irrigated by drip irrigation. We have a lot of plantings which are never irrigated. So these are not so uh, climate change conform. So this is a cool glade of uh, a fantasy glade of, a, um, of an Asian um, uh, Malayan um, uh, border with lilies and hydrangeas uh, and um, persicarias. The European Meadows, a totally different appearance. So native plants is also a matter. Uh, since a few years, it's really important to have also some examples from native meadows that they can be attractive. So this is a moist meadow around the pond and an Asian moist woodland margin with hemorrhoid calis and um, uh, lilium. Well, you have seen Inspiration can be natural vegetation with, of course, the necessary um, adaptions. Especially, um, I believe that this is a good way for urban green spaces um, to get a tense of atmosphere, of ecology, of aesthetics, and uh, also to reduce the maintenance uh, cost. So we mainly concentrate on stress and disturbance tolerant grassland communities, which I'm, I'm trialing. This is my main uh, research, um, Central Asian and also North American, but also European and Central, uh, European and Central Asian steppe um, communities. And um, prairie always took me along and I will show you some examples. This is the template in nature. Um, a real prairie. You see also the beautiful layering of these plants, uh, these emergent um, sylphiums. And this is my version. This is an unwatered, unirrigated, uh, and unfertilized uh, prairie. So this is what we can use really on, on traffic islands. And it's very beautiful, of course. And it takes some years to figure out how to combine the plants, which proportions these plants need which sociability they have. So I really had to study these in situ and in the uh, prairies. But of course, this is a, a sophisticated and um, um, condensed version of, of uh, prairie. This is the same planting in spring. Um, 
Of course, I use also non prairie plants here as a compromise, like the alliums. They grow very well in these kind of situations to make it more attractive because prairie plants are quite late. So we have to make all these compromises. Uh, so in this case, I'm, I'm a designer. I'm not a, we are a botanical garden, but my emphasis is not to recreate exact models of natural plant communities. It has only the sense of a prairie. And this, I think usually I, I can walk um, in this. So it's a condensed version of prairie. And also, of course, the, uh, the aesthetics of the decay is very important. And you can imagine to maintain these kind of intermingled, very dynamic plants is not so easy. So it's uh, you know, like a, a formal border is much easier to understand. This is always to predict what will happen if I do this or what will happen if I don't do this. This makes it uh, more um, uh, sophisticated to, to maintain these kind of plantings. This is the early June is in, like in every garden, very beautiful. The second um, model plant community is the Asian stepper. This is in the Tian Shan mounds in Kyrgyzstan. Looks almost like a planting. And um, these are the versions in, in Hermansov. This is a very good model, which we use often in, in traffic islands and in public green spaces, because this is unfertilized, unirrigated all year, even in the driest years, um, we don't water this. Of course, the blooming time is mainly May and June. This is very beautiful and also good for insects, of course. And you see, we do uh, maintenance records for over 20 years now, and we know pretty much what kind of plant community needs what kind of uh, maintenance or what amount of maintenance. And for this example, this is about this planting. And when I started in um, 1989, it was like a border. It was treated like a border. So with high maintenance of 20, almost 21 minutes per square meter a year. And then we applied all this, use machinery, mineral mulching, no irrigation anymore, no soil disturbance, which is very important. No, no, no fertilizing. And from one year to the other, so we applied a mineral mulching. This is very important. So mulching is a key uh, issue. So we came from 21 minutes in one year to eight minutes. And in the following year, we ended up in, within three years to 3.5 minutes per square meter, just to matching the maintenance um, uh, to the environment, which is a stepper environment with you know well-drained lean soil actually so before it was treated like an english border uh, you can do that but uh, it's not appropriate to this habitat so that helps a lot this is the planting to the left then uh, this is about in, in september so that's that helps a lot and this moved on to a new idea of a random uh, planting style um, we um, try to develop, uh, which doesn't need actually a planting plan, just a list. Um, and it's kind of a formu formulaic uh, planting, like modules actually, which are assessed usually five years and mainly for public um, green. And uh, crucial is the sociability actually, and to match these uh, plant assortment really to the um, to the habitat and how it looks. So this is how the influence of Hermansov beyond the uh, uh, doors um, influences the surroundings in our area. So this is a um, um, industrialist uh, company, not the Freudenberg company, where we use these kind of um, mixed, uh, balanced mixed uh, uh, planting, which is a very intermingled, very um, dynamic uh, planting style. This is actually the, the further development of the new germ style. It's still the new germ style, but not from the 1980s. It's just, you know, 40 years after. And this is this formulaic uh, planting sheet. I, I don't ca can go deeper in it, but you see there's a design layer and a functional layer and every um, um, uh, functional type like structural plants, seasonal theme plants, companion plants, ground covers, uh, they have their certain proportion. 
actually. So it's about proportions, which is based on the idea of um, uh, plant communities and uh, the idea of um, sociability of plants. So everything comes together, but it's easier understandable. And it would be like this, you know, it looks a little bit chaotic, chaotic, but it's, it's all by these kind of um, structural um, or, or um, um, the, the, the random, it, it, it is random in the case of planting, but it's not random in the, in the case of thinking. So the, you need a lot of thinking, you know your plant and to put them in these different uh, categories. And you can apply it, of course, in parking, parking lots. So what we trial in the garden will be applied in, in real public green and also here. And the maintenance uh, to finish the whole thing, um, we apply to the plant survival strategies of um, Professor Grime from Sheffield University, which, which is uh, proved to be quite useful. So think about stress tolerance strategy, competitive strategy, and rural strategy, which are usually the, the weeds. And we concentrate, of course, mainly on the stress tolerance strategy for public green, but also the competition uh, strategy is very useful. And you see, uh, we do these um, calculations for over 20 years now. And now you see which, which kind of plantings are low maintenance, which are mainly um, plantings with some restriction um, of, um, of uh, resources. So like shade, uh, drought, uh, full sun, uh, lean soil and so on. So the borders are always high in maintenance and the more restrictions you have, the lower is the maintenance. This is a quite interesting uh, finding. And then after we found this, we thought what is behind it? And then we found the strategies um, of plants are actually uh, behind this. And um, one example, this is the border, but uh, the, the North American perennials actually. So we do a recycling system in this case. So no organic matter goes out. So we just shredder it on the ground in spring before the bulbs come out and everything stays into, uh, in, in the ground. So this is one system. This is the competitive system. And running through the um, seasons, these are plants which are really fast growing. Beautiful, you know these plants, but maybe you have not treated them in this um, way. It works very well with tall perennials, which are not evergreen, actually. So you can do it really with a trimmer and with a lawnmower. And of course, asters uh, use a lot of trees also, which are resilient to climate change, uh, like sassafras. And of course, the season ends now, and also um, the lecture ends. And uh, so this is the view to the um, to the um, gardener's house. And I use a lot of dahlias in recent years, single dahlias, which are actually seedlings of dahlia coccinea, and we, we we leave them in the ground. They are, they prove quite hardy, a little bit of leaf mulch, and it worked quite well. So we treat them almost like perennials. Well, this was a rush through our ideas and probably uh, totally different from what we have seen before, of course, which was more historical, but you see historical roots and going on to the future, which is quite, quite interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Cassian. And of course, your new German style is already overtaken, as you're explaining, by a new, new German style. <laughs> and um, then that will become a historic style in itself, won't it? So uh, it keeps going. Now, we don't have very long for questions. Uh, we do have, however, Mark Laird has reappeared. He's obviously got up in a Canadian morning. Mark, great to see you. So if, Cassian, you could stop sharing your screen. Yeah, sure, so, sorry. <laughs> no problem at all, no problem. And then if anybody else is happy in the panel to join the discussion, we just have um, 10, 12 minutes left. 
uh, before we finish at four. So, Mark, welcome to the um, session. We're all sort of coming to the end of the day and you're just uh, starting your day. But uh, one of the questions that came out of your uh, talk came from Jan in Norway. Uh, and he just wanted us, it's a distinction really, you use the term pleasure grounds and parks. And he wondered if you could say a bit more about the different areas and what they mean. Yes, well, traditionally, we would regard the pleasure ground as everything within the ha-ha and the park as everything outside the ha-ha. So you don't want sheep or deer or cattle jumping over a ha-ha into your pleasure ground where they would eat up the perennials and the shrubs and so on. The maintenance of a pleasure ground is entirely different from the maintenance of a park. And you do need to have somebody cutting your grass with a scythe and so on. So in the case of Paynes Hill, we don't actually have ha-ha. We have separation by a, an invisible fence. It was painted a particular color, which kept the horses or the sheep or the deer within the park. Um, and the lake also provided a barrier. So uh, when you're talking about shrubbery, and theatrical planting in that sense, you obviously are talking about an area which is high maintenance. And uh, I was learning a lot from Cassian just now about how we could rethink some of our methods to apply 21st century maintenance techniques to what is otherwise a labor intensive form of horticulture which back in the 18th century was possible because you have a lot of cheap labor, including that category that I emphasize, the weeder woman, weeder women. We don't uh, have that labor available and therefore- People Volunteers, however. <laughs> volunteers, <laughs> that's right, say. yeah, that's equipment. right. <laughs> but uh, there was a very important point that I was trying to bring out which is not black and white in terms of gender. But when we're thinking about the antecedents of horticultural practice in the 20th century and 21st century, we have to think about amateur uh, expertise in terms of botany, natural history, and horticulture. And women unable to be part of the professions began to develop ways which would eventually come to fruition under Gertrude Jekyll and Beatrix Farrand and so on. So um, there is an important point, but to go to the po point of saying that color is a special preserve of women, Cassian has just proved how well uh, his planting schemes manage that question of color. So that one is a, is a tricky one. So um, thank you very much, Mark. That was really interesting. I went, I went beyond the question. No, no, absolutely. That's the whole point of a panel discussion. Sadly, we don't have a huge amount of time. Let me just um, ask another question. Now, this one is to Cassian. Um, there are two, actually. Uh, one is um, a practical one, which I think ties in with, with what Mark was saying. How do you deal with weeding? in these plant communities? Are the plantings when established or changed based on the principle of changing the soil with completely weed-free soil, or do you replant in existing soil? Well, in the garden, we, we replant in existing soil. And of course, if you do a new planting, you have this disturbance and you have to do activate your your um, seed bank, which is in every soil. Of course, in a very well cultivated soil, it might be a little bit reduced. And you have two possibilities. Um, the density, you know, really plants that cover the soil, not certainly ground covers, but especially these tall perennials, they're really covering the ground in the summer, so they smother all the weeds. 
Uh, not totally, uh, but it helps a lot. So we really um, avoid any soil disturbance if it's not necessary. Of course, if you plant bulbs now, we have to disturb the soil, but we do it, you know, with, with a pointed shovels, just lift the soil, put it underneath, and really try to till over. So there's a lot of little things you can do if you understand how um, ecology works. Uh, James Hitchmore always says, you have to think like a plant. And if you know their strategy, you can cut off their strategy. And, and this is quite uh, helpful. Of course, we have weeds. You know, it's, it's about 6,000 hours going into the garden. And there's a lot of weeding. Uh, but in these stress tolerant plant communities, we avoid the weeds uh, because weeds are just, you know, mulching is very crucial. So every mulch is, is good to, to get of the light um, to trigger the seeds from germinating. So a five or six um, centimeters layer of, um, of uh, mulch helps a lot to deactivate actually uh, the seed bank in a soil. Not the perennials, of course, uh, like quackgrass and so on, they stick through, but at least all the annuals you can almost eliminate with a mulch layer applied immediately uh, after the planting, or even we do it with mineral mulch before the planting and plant through the mulch. This helps, like it reduces it about 10 minutes per square meter a year. So 50 minutes would be in a disturbed unmulched area and you reduce it to five minutes in a mulched area, which is really a lot. And of course, in a bedding, you can't do that. You know, this is the most, the most weeds we have in the bedding areas traditionally. You know, that was, I think, to William Robinson's time, the same uh, uh, thing. And then maybe he changed to perennials because it was more clever, I think. Yeah. Great. Um, so another question um, for Cassian. Um, can you name some other good examples of the new German style um, elsewhere, both in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, that we should be aware of? Yes. Historically, I have to apply that the German, new German style started actually in the early 80s when, when Hansen published his book. And the first good example which is still existing is in the West Park in Munich, which was a, the federal garden or the, the international garden show in 1983. This is probably one of the oldest existing planting. Uh, other good plantings uh, from my ancestor, Urs Walser, is in the um, in Stuttgart in the Killesberg. These are very old plantings, also from the early 1980s, actually. Um, yeah, and then um, yeah, where are uh, so uh, well? Uh, actually, in, in usually in 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 garden show um, areas, former garden show areas, Augsburg also and um, in, in some city parks. So Würzburg is also, so mainly these are garden show sites, former garden show sites, because there are the plantings still maintained. Other plantings are maybe lost or reinstalled, of course. And, um, and in many cities, of course, you see the, 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 the newer way, this intermingled way of, of the improved New German style. Uh, of, of course, uh, like in the Westpark of Augsburg, uh, which I also was employed, uh, which got the uh, German Landscape Architecture Prize uh, last year, where several hectares of uh, uh, intermingled new germ style plantings, the modern plantings, of course, yeah. That's really good. I mean, and also some of your slides were of roundabouts and uh, car parks, so you don't even have to go into gardens to see some of right. them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, something that you said, Mark, that uh, really interested me, and you sort of posed a question really about how some of your um, work really has, is, it's ephemeral in a way, in that they were planned as 20 year planting programs, and yours have actually outlasted those, some of them 40 years. Um, I wondered if you had, um, anybody really has a view on how long our most recent style of gardening is likely to last. Is it really perennial or are we going to have to intervene and, and restore things and find the plants again? Anybody have any views there? 
So everybody. Well, I, I, I have actually a clue because this is a very, very important question. You know, what is the life cycle of a planting? Of course, in any planting, you have a half year life cycle or even shorter. A perennial planting, if it, if it is good maintained, I would say 10 to 15 years. In public green, which is quite good here in Hermansdorf, we have sometimes 30 years, so it's very well maintained. Uh, but of course, you 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 have to. Um, sometimes it's better, you know. It can be unmanageable if you have so many weeds and you know it, it's neglected for some years. I think it's better to just get rid of the whole stuff and replant it because plants are very quick. Uh, you see a lot of plants which are not well maintained and the the, the um, Gardeners are very frustrated because they can't keep up and they try their best, but, you know, they, they can't uh, keep it. And I, I would suggest, you know, say the life cycle is over, get the, the, the first maybe 15 centimeters off uh, of the soil, put some new engineered soil in and replant it, actually. So realistically, 10 to 15 years, which mm. is good for a public planting. Yeah. I could just add quickly, I mean, there's a historical dimension that we were grappling with. In uh, the 18th century, you would expect through inheritance that a son replacing a father would undo often what the father had done and taste was changing. And so there was an inevitable changeover, which was generational, which corresponded to planting cycles. Obviously, in the case of what we're trying to do, which is to replicate systems which would have been replaced through inheritance, we're trying to make them sustained longer than a generation. And this is a, a big challenge. Shrubbery is in an 18th century sense, inherently unstable as a system. You can coppice, and that can be a way that you rejuvenate, or as in the case of the amphitheater, by extending it forward, we rejuvenated the front. But ultimately, you are playing around with those life cycles of annuals, perennials, uh, woody plants, and so on. In the case of Rest Park, which is one that I've pointed you to, what's so interesting there is that we have two generations of women who uh, span most of the 18th century into the 19th century. And although there was a change, a generational change, there was also a big emphasis on continuity and care over time, which eventually led to our practices, which we would call heritage. So I think there are very interesting questions there about uh, what happens when one generation replaces another. Fascinating. Lucy, you look like you had something to say before. No, I was just I was just thinking of Great Dixter, not a and that's not family generations, but from Christopher Lloyd's mother to him and yeah. now on to Fergus Garrett, of course. Yeah. changes and, and the current planting at Great Dixter is is hugely you know huge amounts of wildlife and and wonderful wonderful planting. Yeah. Fascinating. So we are going to have to wrap up I'm afraid we've gone over our time but just to say keep an eye on the website because we're planning where the practical workshop is going to happen in July that's linked with this webinar. We haven't yet decided exactly it's in the UK um, and we have um, the first half of July it's a couple of days we think it's the 10th and the 11th or possibly 11th and 12th um, of July and so we hope to see some of you and we can continue the discussion online as well uh, I shall be putting a reading list up and of course recordings of these sessions will be available so thank you very much everybody for taking part and um, hope to see you again at the next webinar which is on trees and climate change so a really important topic thank you